Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dan Gorodnik. I'm the chair of the City Planning Commission. Uh, welcome to today's review session. Uh, today's date is June 27th, 2022. Um, if this is your first time with us, today is a public review session for uh, the City Planning Commission, where the staff of the Department of City Planning briefs commissioners on applications that are about to begin the city's official land use process known as ULERP, or we'll have a public hearing on Wednesday. Um, I do wanna note uh, that in our continued effort to make our materials more accessible, you will find uh, a new format for today's review session agenda. Uh, it's really easy, user-friendly, and it follows the new format that we introduced for the calendar. So I want to thank uh, city planning staff for making this happen. Um, so today, we're going to cover a variety of topics, uh, including the relocation of a fire department EMS station uh, to West 29th Street in Hudson Yards in West Chelsea, uh, bringing emergency services uh, to the area and to the Block 675 project that will include around 270 affordable, sorry, 230 affordable homes uh, close to the 7 train in this high uh, income area. Uh, plus, we're going to talk about office space for a variety of other city and state uses, like the Office of Court Administration in Brooklyn, the Queens District Attorney, and the New York City Law Department, uh, also in Queens. Uh, in Manhattan on East 14th Street, we're going to look at a proposed mixed-use building by NYCHA and a private applicant with 175 homes, over 50 of them uh, affordable. Uh, it will include retail and a daycare. Um, the Department of City Planning will also provide some follow-up information about a project that had a hearing two weeks ago on the Hallett's uh, Peninsula in Astoria. Uh, to create 1,400 homes, uh, 350 of them affordable, an acre of public waterfront green space, uh, including a potential new overlook accessible to the public. Uh, and hearings this week, of course, you know, we will be having our hearings uh, before the City Planning Commission where members of the public can come and testify. That will be uh, this Wednesday at uh, 10 o'clock. And our hearings this week uh, will also include the Bruckner Sites rezoning, which is a proposal for development of four new uh, mixed use buildings with 339 units in Throgs Neck uh, in the Bronx. So that's just to give you a flavor for what's coming. Uh, we are going to kick things off though with a really special presentation on a new report that comes out of the Department of City Planning and the New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, which shows that the New York City metro region, which includes New York City, of course, Long Island, the lower Hudson Valley, northern New Jersey, southwestern Connecticut, is leading the country on jobs and funding in the life sciences industry. This news is a testament to our region's ability to attract and retain really amazing talent and our unparalleled support of these industries. So we're really excited uh, about the results of this report uh, and we are going to dig into the details uh, with uh, uh, Carolyn Grossman Marr and Matt Maskowitz from City Planning's regional planning team. Um, and uh, with that, we can ignore my uh, electronic devices beeping at us. Uh, with that, we also have Kyle uh, Konecki from EDC. Thank you, Kyle, for, uh, for being with us here today. So with that, um, let's get started. Ryan, uh, any additional uh, opening before we go off to Carolyn and team on the report? No, that, uh, that's our special presentation for today. Okay. All right, let's do it then. Welcome aboard. All right. Thank you, Chair Garodnik, and good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Matt Waskevitz. I am an Associate Planner here at City Planning, 
in our economic development and regional planning division. And so over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll provide you with an overview of a new first of its kind report that city planning and the Economic Development Corporation have jointly released on the life sciences economy in the New York City metro region. And so I'll turn things over to my colleague, Kyle from ADC to introduce himself. Yeah, hi there. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my name is Kyle Kinnicky. I am uh, the Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a sense of my background. I am a basic researcher by training and trade. I have my PhD in genetics from Columbia University. Um, I worked for several years in tech transfer and then actually was an entrepreneur for a couple of years as director of operations. So with that, um, I'm not going to be able to do, you know, talk too much about ULERP or C64 memos or anything like that. But if you have any questions about life science industry, I might be your man for that. So uh, we can actually go ahead and get started. Production, if you want to start with the, the first slide. Thank you. You can actually go ahead right on. So this was the, the report that we, we uh, published recently. Um, and just to, to start things off, I want to start by describing a few reasons why this is actually the right moment for investing in life sciences in the New York City area, as there are really several factors to this puzzle. Uh, first, over the last few decades, life sciences as an industry has actually transformed from being primarily conducted uh, in suburban style research and business campuses to much more so being startup driven and clustered near research institutions. Uh, I probably don't need to tell this group very much about it, but New York City obviously has a number of uh, world class medical and research institutions that provide a tremendous talent pipeline and sourcing source for emerging startups. Um, as we'll discuss later, incubators that cater to these university spin outs, uh, spin outs are popping up all over the city and is par uh, partially at least driven by the $1 billion investment made by the mayor's office to be able to fund the EDC's uh, LifeSci NYC effort. Uh, so the second reason why right now is a great time to invest in life sciences is a reason that it probably need, doesn't need very much of the explanation, but the COVID-19 pandemic has really underscored the need uh, to develop new vaccines and other public health interventions and has seen unprecedented public investments to be able to facilitate this research. And then thirdly, an aging population across the United States has really deepened the interest in new therapeutics to be able to tackle some of humanity's most pressing biological issues. Uh, thus, investing in the life sciences sector not only means more jobs and more economic growth, but also a better quality of life for New Yorkers and the global population. Next slide. Um, so to be able to capitalize on the shift uh, towards developing the life science industry, it's really helpful to understand and examine what really is needed for a new or growing biotech company to be in order to be successful. First off, it needs a certain concentration of existing small and large life science companies in order to develop a thriving ecosystem. Second, a strong uh, talent pool must be present to be able to find the workers that are necessary to run the businesses. Third, both public and private investment is required to be able to fund these ventures. In New York City, this primarily comes from the NIH, venture capital firms that have both offices in the city as well as elsewhere, as well as direct connection to Wall Street and some of the top financial institutions in the world. Finally, these businesses really need space. They need somewhere to be able to conduct their research and business operations. And despite having some of the most expensive real estate in the world, New York City and the metro region is really working hard to be able to unlock this space for the growing sector. So from here, I wanna hand things back over to Matt as he expands on how this report really measured each of the ingredients that the life science economy, of the life science economy, uh, in order to show the impact and growth potential of the science of the sector, and in particular, the New York City metro strength relative to other regions. Thank you, Kyle. Next slide, please. And so an important context for, for this research is, is our overall NYC metropolitan economy which is the largest economic engine in, in the nation. So the NYC Metro, as, as city planning defines it, includes the five boroughs of New York City, but also the surrounding 26 counties in Long Island, in the Hudson Valley, in Northern New Jersey, and in Southwest Connecticut. 
And so this 31 county metro region is about 10% of US GDP, which is about $2 trillion. And just for a sense of scale, if we were our own country as a metro, we'd be, it, be the eighth largest country in the world in terms of economic output. And this puts us at a larger scale than that of Canada or South Korea. And so the New York City Metro is growing. It has about 10.7 million jobs. And in the decade prior to the COVID-19 pandemic has added over 900,000 jobs. In this decade, the New York City Metro, in particular New York City, has seen tremendous growth in industries adjacent to and comp complementary with life sciences. So this includes healthcare and the information sector, which we would define as, as roughly the tech sector. In the tech sector in particular, information has grown at a rate more than six times in, our, in New York City than that of the country overall. Next slide, please. And so looking at life sciences, when you measure us at this scale of the 31 county metro region, you can see that our metro is in fact larger, both in terms of businesses and jobs compared to any other metro area in, in the country. And so we are the lar largest life sciences economy in the country, 150,000 jobs, more than 5,000 businesses, and about $23 billion in wages last year. And so this puts us at about 14,000 more businesses than San Francisco, which is the second largest in terms of jobs, and about 30% more life sciences businesses than Boston Cambridge Metro, which is the largest, second largest in terms of businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So life sciences consists of three core industries, these being research and development, manufacturing, and medical diagnostic laboratories. So smaller IND, R&D facilities, they tend to concentrate in locations with access to public transportation and urban amenities that can be used to attract and retain workers. And so New York City is, uh, this is a competitive advantage for us here. And it, New York City accounts for 14% of the region's R&D jobs, but 27% of its businesses. Manufacturing businesses tend to be larger than those in R&D, both in the number of employees and in the size of their facilities. And as a result, this industry tends to be concentrated in suburban locations with access to freight distribution and highway transportation networks. Lastly, diagnostic laboratories are clustered in and near areas of higher population density, and the business locations roughly mirror the geography of New York City Metro's population. Next slide, please. So R&D in particular is a high value industry and it's growing most in transit accessible locations, especially right here in the city. Over the last decade, the New York City Metro has added over 600 R&D companies, half of which were located in New York City. And this data suggests that CEOs and startups are bringing their life sciences firms to be located near transit and located near transit oriented innovation centers and especially uh, near regional large institutions Outside of the city, this can include Rutgers, Stony Brook, and Yale. The last decade has also seen over 800 new diagnostic laboratories added throughout the region, and they're clustered mostly in, in centers in New York City, uh, in particular Southern Brooklyn, and in occupying larger form pharmaceutical manufacturing sites across the, the Hudson River in New Northern New Jersey. So diagnostic labs, they represent a, a smaller component of regional economic activity than R&D, but they do account for a growing source of employment and life sciences that does not require an advanced degree. Next slide, please. I'll turn things back to Kyle for a few slides to talk more about the, the growing life sciences clusters here in our metro. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so as we were talking, so Matt has actually was talking a little bit more about the numbers. Now I want to get a little bit more nuanced. And so um, as discussed earlier, creating a critical mass of small and large companies is really vital to the industry's success. And so to this end, clusters of these businesses often naturally begin to form. So here we can actually see a map of the New York City metro area with 16 different established and emerging clusters across the region. These clusters are often anchored by world-class institutions and linked by the country's most extensive mass transit network, including regional rail bus networks that connect NYC's own extensive bus and subway system. On the following slides, I'll go into each one of these clusters in a little bit more depth to be able to describe both the varied and comprehensive op offerings available within each one of these clusters. So next slide. Uh, to start off, um, I'm going to begin actually in Manhattan, where Kipps Bay is being billed as the city's core life science hub with anchor research institutions, including NYU, 
Langone Medical Center, uh, and Bellevue Hospital. There's currently more than 1 million square feet of commercial and incubator lab space available in, in Kipps Bay at the Alexandria Center for Life Sciences and Deerfield's Cure Building at 345 Park Avenue. The Upper East Side is home to a second large cluster of medical research institutions, including a, a Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, Rockefeller University, Weill Cornell Medicine, and the New York City, uh, the New York Blood Center, which is building a new facility on East 67th Street. Uh, thirdly, we have Midtown West, which contains the newly opened Hudson Research Center, home to several mid-sized life science companies, as well as the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Uh, Hudson Square is home to J Labs at NYC, which hosts the New York Genome Center, as well as BioLabs at NYU Langone, two of the eight incubator spaces in NYC for growing life science companies. And then West Harlem, with proximity to Columbia University and the City College of, City College of New York's Advanced Science Research Center, is a growing cluster in northern Manhattan and includes the Mink and Tasty buildings. Well, whereas um, where I come from up in the upper Manhattan, there is a cluster that's home to Alexandria Launch Labs at Columbia uh, Biosciences Incubator, which actually just held its grand opening last week, as well as Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Uh, next slide. So outside of Manhattan, space is actually available at a relatively lower price, which presents opportunities for life sciences companies coming out of the incubators uh, to be able to graduate into larger spaces. A great example of this is actually in Long Island City, which has seen a flurry of recent laboratory spaces come online, including InnoLabs and Alexandria Bindery, and an announced pipeline that it will bring this cluster to about 1.25 million square feet by 2024. Uh, in central Brooklyn, we have SUNY Downstate, which is home to a 5,000 square foot incubator, cultivating research coming out of SUNY Downstate's Medical Center and Kings County Hospital. Um, and then we have Biobat at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, which is home to several biotech companies conducting research and manufacturing in the, on the Brooklyn waterfront. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is an emerging as a biomanufacturing hub as well having played a key role in New York City's uh, initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic by producing ventilators and personal protective equipment for frontline medical workers. Finally, up in the Bronx, we have uh, Morris Park, which is a, a burgeoning life science cluster, soon to be home to the Montefiore Einstein Accelerated Biotechnology Research Center, or Embark, uh, which is built to be a, a biomanufacturing operation focused on cell, gene, and antibody therapy production. Uh, next slide. So outside of the city, clusters within our regional partners help to promote the life science ecosystem within New York City by exchanging talent uh, through both forward and reverse commuters. And so in central New Jersey, there, uh, there, the, in central New Jersey, um, there is a, a set, there are several large legacy pharmaceutical corporations uh, like Johnson and Johnson, Bristol Myers Squibb and clusters of R&D startups near Princeton and Rutgers University. Uh, Northern New Jersey contagio, also contains large corporations such, a, such as Novartis and Merck, uh, and a burgeoning life science activity centers in Newark and Jersey City. Long Island has a growing uh, life science cluster of R&D near Stony Brook and Brookhaven National Laboratories to add dynamism to existing biomanufacturing throughout the suburban locations. Uh, the Lower Hudson Cluster is home to Regeneron's headquarters in Westchester County and Pfizer's historic Pearl River campus in Rockland County. And then finally, New Haven and the Connecticut Coast have seen recent investment in laboratory space within walking distance of the, New York, of the Metro North Railroad stations. And so next, I'm actually going to turn things back over to Matt one more time to be able to delve deeper into the New York City Metro region's talent pool. Thank you, Kyle. So you've heard a few slides now about businesses and how they're forming, where they're forming, and the clusters throughout our metro. Um, next slide, please. And now I'll, I'll delve more into the second ingredient of what we consider to be a life sciences ecosystem, which is talent and workforce. And particularly, uh, this is a place where the New York City metro and New York City shine. And so over the last decade, New York City has seen a, a tremendous growth in, in, work for, in workers, nearly half a million people 
over the last decade. And 93% of this workforce growth has occurred within the city or within our region, but transit accessible to Midtown Manhattan using our regional rail. And so this is particularly important for um, companies who are looking to attract life sciences workers because that transit orientation means that companies who are relocating to or growing within the region can recruit on a broader scale and they can leverage our region's uh, transit network to find workers with the right skill set, the right education, and the right training to match what they need. Next slide, please. And so this might be, become a recurring theme, but when you measure us all together at a metro scale, we are in fact larger uh, than any other metro region in the country when it comes to the specialized workers that you need to make a life sciences economy thrive. And so New York City Metro has um, about 83,000 workers in these specialized occupations. These are your biochemists, but also your clinical laboratory technicians. Anything that aligns as an occupation with the right training and education and experience needed for working at a life sciences company. About a third of these workers are employed directly at a life sciences company, while 30% work in medical and education institutions. Next slide, please. But life sciences is more than just PhDs. This chart shows the education level and salary band for life sciences workers in our region. Clinical laboratory technicians, which are about a quarter of life sciences workers, don't need a bachelor's degree. Life sciences offers pathways for professional growth through formal education, of course, but also certificate programs and pathways for on-the-job training. The Life Sci NYC internship program, which is backed by a city investment of $5 million, has resulted in more than 400 student placements throughout its first four years, a majority of whom have been women or people of color. Next slide, please. The life sciences also relies on a range of occupations to support companies. Life sciences companies employ the people with these specialized skill sets, the, the clinical lab technicians, the engineers and biochemists, but they also employ a variety of supporting roles. These include business managers, lawyers, administrative assistants, and custodial staff. For every one person employed at a life sciences company in a technical occupation, there are on average three workers employed in other occupations, which leads to a growing diversity of jobs at all skill levels and from all backgrounds. Next slide, please. The New York City Metro also provides training from dozens of world-class institutions to fill tomorrow's life sciences jobs. Our New York City Metro produces more life sciences graduates than any other leading metro, nearly 2,700 graduates each year. Next slide, please. Across the metro, about 65 institutions offer programs in life sciences. New York City accounts for half of the metro's uh, PhD graduates each year across the region, Columbia, Rutgers, Stony Brook, Weill Cornell Medical College, Princeton, and Yeshiva University have the most life sciences PhDs. Next slide, please. So that was, that was a little bit more on, on talent. We'll focus now a little bit on funding. So life sciences innovation starts with research and public funding is critical in developing the next generation of medical devices, therapeutics, vaccines, and other health-based interventions. The New York City Metro has the most NIH funding of any other leading metro, about $4.1 billion last year. Next slide, please. Over 70% of that funding was directed to institutions and businesses right here in New York City, Columbia University, Mount Sinai, NYU School of Medicine, and Weill Cornell Medical College. These four institutions collect collectively accounted for more than $2 billion in NIH grants last year, and they are the city's largest recipients. Outside of Manhattan, Albert Einstein College of Medicine is the largest recipient of, New York, of NIH funding in New York City with about $200 million in grants each year. And this is a key indicator of Morris Park's promise as a future life sciences cluster in New York City. Next slide, please. Venture capital from the private side is an important ingredient for incubating new life sciences businesses. VC funding in the tri-state area has nearly tripled since 2015 and startups in 2020 received more than $3.3 billion, which places the New York City Metro third behind Boston and the Bay Area in terms of funding. And I will note that the majority of this funding was attributed to New York, New York state-based businesses within our metro. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll wrap up here with a couple of uh, data points on space and laboratory space in particular and its availability. So the New York City Metro has um, about 26.3 uh, million square feet of laboratory space. 
And this places our Metro third behind Boston and the Bay Area in terms of space availability. Now space is critical for um, R&D labs, which tend to be clustered near research institutions and transit hubs, but it's also important that the space be flexible and allow for, for space for companies to grow. And so next slide, please. Uh, our Metro is adding over 5 million square feet of laboratory space at a range of locations and needs. About half of this laboratory space pipeline is located within New York City, and it indicates a strong market for new lab space in the region's core markets. The pipeline includes multiple buildings in Long Island City, Midtown West, and in Kipps Bay. Uh, next slide, please. And the New York City Metro provides a broad range of laboratory space at prices that are comparable to other leading metros. While startups looking for space in Manhattan, for example, may find asking rents at the higher end of this range, New York City offers a growing inventory of different types of space at multiple price points. And so that's particularly important as we're thinking about growing laboratory space in the Metro outside of, outside of Manhattan and within the, uh, the rest of the boroughs of New York City. Uh, Last slide, please. And so New York City and other governments across the region uh, have a shared interest in fostering a connected life sciences ecosystem. Together, the sum of our investments, uh, in both in the city and state, are making for New York City to be a region that can be a leading center of life sciences innovation. Uh, for, for too long, political boundaries may have contributed to a sense of that our tri-state power is not as great as it truly is. But COVID-19 has reshaped this landscape. We have new opportunities for partnership and a spirit of collaboration that can help um, can connect our life sciences ecosystem. And so together we can be a, a, global, a global leader in life sciences innovation and ready to combat future public health challenges, drive innovation. I'll turn things over to Kyle to speak more about uh, what the city is doing and then open things up for any questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah, so honestly, just to uh, kind of reiterate what you see on the slide here, uh, back in 2016, the NYC EDC had launched its LifeSci NYC initiative, a 10-year commitment to be able to grow New York City's life science economy. And this investment was actually doubled to a billion dollars in 2021. So when you combine that with Empire State Development and New York State's uh, $620 million statewide life science initiative, we now have a combined commitment of over $1.5 billion to be able to grow the life science ecosystem. How we're generally using the, the $1 billion in our office is really through these three main goals, is to one, create commercial lab space and incubators so that startups have the room to grow, to support nonprofit facilities and catalyze new research that can translate into companies, jobs, and new medicines, and then finally, also to build a diverse talent pipeline of life science workers and support early stage life science companies. Um, and really with that, I just wanna say thank you for inviting me and I'll open the room up then for questions. Great, thank you very much uh, to both of you and uh, to all of your uh, collaborators on this report. I, I had a, just a couple of quick questions and, and an observation, and I'm going to turn it over to commissioners. Um, is this the first time that we have seen this type of regional uh, review of New York City's strengths, uh, New York City Metro's strengths in this area, or is this, um, you know, has this been done uh, before? Is this is the first time that we've seen a, a report of its kind. Uh, other other real estate broker real estate brokers that produce report on life sciences, CBRE, JLL, Cushman and Wakefield, they tend to measure our metro as being uh, separate component parts. So they'll they'll mention New York City and they'll mention New Jersey, uh, and often not together as a combined metro. But then you'll look and see that same report cites all of the Boston Cambridge metro as one life sciences ecosystem, all of the Bay Area, including San Francisco, San Jose as one metro. And so we said, wait a minute, we actually are a combined metro. And so if you measure us all together, that's what this report does in comparing apples to apples. So it really is, it's the first time we're seeing this. And, and if I may add, um, uh, uh, thanks for the question, Chair. Uh, this is also the direct 
uh, result of our engagement and collaboration with regional partners and a direct request that we heard from economic development stakeholders all across the region, right? We recognize that New York City actually had a lot to gain from understanding all of the resources and assets around us. But similarly, and, and maybe even more so, we heard from our colleagues in Long Island, in Westchester, in New Jersey, in Connecticut, that they were dependent on our centrality and on the connections to us and were using that to market their own assets but uh, you know, without support and without those connections. And so being able to visualize this and actually show the ways in which we are connected is something we think is incredibly important um, and needed, not just for us, but for all of us that are trying to make the case as to why we are uh, more uh, you know, uh, competitive against our, our competitor regions. And, uh, and it certainly tells an incredible story when you put it in, in that uh, framework and in that context. I mean, it really is, um, it's, it's very impressive and it also says a lot about our regional strength in this area and I hope uh, people will take note of it. Um, uh, and my, my only other question was what you might recommend for uh, more or greater collaboration across the region. Um, you know, to ensure that we build on the strengths that we clearly already, and in some cases, just organically have developed. So what, what would you, what would you suggest here? Matt, would you like to jump in first or shall I take this one? Uh, you, you can take this one and I'll, I'll jump in afterwards. Sure. So, um, you know, first of all, I think, you know, from the, from the regional team, uh, I think we think a lot about thinking regionally and acting locally. So while the import, I think there's an incredible importance to how we are able to visualize and understand our assets collectively, ultimately all of the ingredients that the report talks about, whether it's funding, space, talent, all depend on local actors, right? So this story tells us things we already knew but can reaffirm about the importance of not just New York City, which we are very laser focused on, of course, as as, as you well know, uh, Commissioner, um, but everyone building the space to house the next generation of life sciences businesses. And we can see that happening in our, in our regional partners as well, but I think this gives additional ammunition. Similarly, the fight to create affordability and the um, the growth that our region needs to accommodate the talent and workforce that can stay here to, you know, power this industry. This also gives ammunition, I think, to, the, to, the, to that case. Um, so I think there's a lot that we can do by telling the story that helps everybody, um, you know, find the strength and ammunition to do the things that they need to do locally to support and grow their asset base. But beyond that, I think there are probably opportunities to be thinking about how our talent ecosystem works more effectively across borders, to think about the federal uh, resources that are being put in and how we might coordinate those better across regions, and also to continue the data sharing and collaboration on assets, right, so that we know a lot of this stuff is very, very idiotic idiosyncratic and we found out things that Westchester has that New York City may not have strengths in just because of the engagement that's happened between the city and our counterparts. So a lot of that work, I think, is really the stuff that, you know, it's just, it's the bootstrap leather, um, you know, that really happens by just creating the relationships across the stakeholders. Um, we've built a lot of those relationships to build this report. And we know that both on the government side and on the civic side, there's a lot of energy and excitement about continuing that relationship building. Great. Um, thank you for that. And I, I will just observe that, um, you know, as we think about some of uh, our own initiatives at city planning, uh, whether it is uh, zoning for economic opportunity, which is designed, at least in part, to enable for more flexibility of the siting of life, life sciences facilities, uh, or uh, the efforts surrounding the Bronx Metro North stations, which of course include Morris Park, which Kyle cited as, you know, a key life sciences uh, cluster for New York City. Um, and of course the opportunity for those four Metro North centers, uh, those four Metro North stations to better connect us regionally from, you know, Manhattan 
and New Jersey to the west, all the way up to New Haven uh, to the east, um, it is uh, a great opportunity for us to further lean into these advantages that we have, uh, we have developed. So I just wanted to note that some of the work that we are pursuing here uh, also, of course, is, uh, is designed to help support this, uh, uh, this effort. So, okay, this is great. Well, thank you. Let me just see what kind of questions we have from the, the commission. The vice chairman, Mr. Knuckles, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, number one, um, in the opening, uh, I think it was slide one, uh, you mentioned a $40 million uh, state fund, I think, to stimulate life sciences activity. Uh, how does that work? And number two, I'm just wondering, uh, with regard to the issue of, of talent and support, uh, do local educational institutions, and I mean SUNY and CUNY, uh, do, should this impact curriculum that's offered in, in the life sciences area? Uh, which is to say, do we have enough uh, uh, curriculum in that regard to help source the, uh, the talent pool that, that, that you say we need? Well, I'll take a, a first uh, attempt at both questions. Thank you for them, okay. Commissioner. Thank you. Um, the, on, on the first one, on the state's funding, I, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the fund, but in general, I do know that it's meant to commercialize some of the ideas coming out of local institutions. So uh, to that point with number two or second part of your question and the role of CUNY in all of this, I think there is great opportunity for um, thinking about the space requirements of institutions and the, the vicinity of institutions for growing life sciences. So what we know about how life sciences works as an industry is that so much of it is driven by innovation happening in a classroom. And so there's an opportunity for, um, for the public and the private sectors to come together in funding more opportunities to grow jobs and businesses located near Near, near these institutions. Now, what this means specifically for below, um, say, the, the bachelor's level, um, we'll defer to CUNY on, on what they would, would or wouldn't need to do with their curriculum. Um, but there is great opportunity for associate's degrees and, and certificates and non-four-year degrees in life sciences, particularly for clinical laboratory technicians and many of the other types of roles that support PhDs in doing the research and can lead, in fact, to further education down the road. Yeah, and actually, if I can chime in to, to build on what Matt just uh, mentioned. So uh, one another um, great asset that the city provides for um, students in K through 12 is the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard Steam Center, where students actually can travel to there to get hands-on education within the life science sector. So this is an example of you know, one of the growing life science clusters that is catering to some of that earliest developing pipeline. Um, secondly, we also do have, as you know, Matt and I mentioned throughout the, the report a couple of times or and the presentation was the life science, um, the life science NYC internship program, which has placed just over 500 students. Most, of, well, I think it's, it's roughly 50%, don't quote me on the number, but it's roughly 50% or more are actually coming from CUNY. Um, they're really trying to prioritize students um, that are coming from CUNY versus, you know, NYU or Columbia to be able to give some of these students that might not have a chance, um, a chance to really actually get some hands on experience uh, working directly with life science companies that are housed here in New York City area. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Great. Let me see if there are other questions or comments here before we close. Sorry, Emma. Okay, well, uh, Carol and Matt, Kyle, thank you very much again for this really incredible piece of work. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, wait, no, no. Mr. Cerullo, I'm very sorry. I, you know I would never neglect you, but I didn't see it. Okay, here he is. Sorry, before I do final thanks, I'm going to go to uh, Commissioner Cerullo. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> and it's good to see everybody. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Carolyn. Always good to see you for sure, too. And um, I have a question that's, it, it's not directly, directly related to 
to the presentation, but it there is a connection to the world we're living in today and a sense of sort of the growing industry in our city and the discussions that, you know, always looking ahead at emerging industries and, and how to grow them. But then, you know, where my head is at in a day to day basis is also about the future of commercial districts, which in many cases involve whether or not people are actually coming to a particular location to do their work. And obviously I'm guessing, particularly on the lab side, that going to a location is almost, a, a, people just don't have labs in their houses. Um, at least I'm sure their neighbors hope they don't, but they're, the, the real, I just wonder if we have a sense as we look at industries today, if we are attempting to calculate and then think ahead of uh, to whether or not people need offices to do this kind of work and, and how much reliability can we have as a city that a certain percentage of jobs or new jobs will actually require commercial office space, activations in commercial districts and, and, and the connection between those, those thoughts, not just an industry, but an industry and where they're working. Um, Cause I don't think we've had to really think very much about that up until COVID, but I just wonder if there's a sense of any of that and, and what's required to be in a location that might be in a commercial district versus, well, these are, all these jobs exist, but this percentage can actually do much of their work remotely. Um, so it was just a, a thought about that. Thank, thanks for the question, Commissioner. Always good to see you. And I will say uh, the last time we saw each other was sitting uh, 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 as the commissioner has also been appointed to the Blue Ribbon panel, uh, the new New York panel, which is considering uh, on behalf of the mayor and the governor, many of these very much larger questions about uh, um, economic transformation. Um, so I will say as part of that, and of course, as part of the work at city planning generally, we are very much thinking about the effects of work from home and trying to get a sense on what it will mean for all of our of our commercial districts. It is, as you know, extraordinarily hard to quantify, you know, percentages and what that will will mean. And so much of that is a story that is yet to be told. But I want to come back to something that Chair Gorodnik focused on the zoning for economic opportunity uh, project, which we look forward to speaking much more with the commission with going forward. And I think the going, the, you know, the presumption we have there is that it will be important to activate all of our spaces for more business opportunities, particularly those that need space as we're seeing a disruption in that in that economic market, right? So it's important to see new businesses taking you know, advantage of the vacancies that, that are appearing in our central businesses districts. It is also important to be thinking about new businesses that can take advantage of our commercial and retail streets that have been hurt. And it's also important to see businesses taking advantage of our manufacturing districts in new ways as we've seen over the last few years, right? As we've seen innovation in the industrial sectors as well. And what's one of the things that may be standing in the way of that, you know, invention could be our zoning rules, right? And we've seen this many times over that the, um, you know, that our arcane rules can sometimes make it difficult for all kinds of businesses and, and staying on life sciences, we've seen this going back a few years, that it's hard to tell the difference between when a life sciences business is an office and an industrial use, right? Because there is a spectrum of activity that's happening, some of which is on computers and some of which is in Petri dishes. And, you know, we like that's that's the nature of business these days is that there are these hybrids between production and office uses and it's our zoning that's not been keeping up. So I think that is something you will hear from us a lot over the coming year as we bring that initiative forward is just trying to create that flexibility so that all of these new businesses can just do what they need to do, obviously in ways that remain you know, non-impactful and retain the quality of life for the city and its residents, but in ways that we think can just make it easier to get access to all kinds of different spaces. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, Carolyn. And I and I 
completely agree. I just say sort of as a general thought for all of us, right, the department and, and the other sort of economic development entities that are, are partnering and looking at all of these things that whether it's on the development side where we talk about this project creates these this many new jobs or this, we should be thinking about the difference between not not that it it not that the economy itself um, may change from the big picture. I've said from the beginning, you know, work from the second and third story up was happening every day. It's what's really happening at the street level that's mo was most impacted. And I think we should be thinking about, you know, separating the issues between jobs in the workplace and jobs, um, because there really will, as the future, I think was the past is showing us in the present, that we should be sort of analyzing those things as we move ahead, both from a land use perspective, but also from economic development perspective and 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 the economy. So anyway, I, I appreciate uh, the conversation about this and and you know look forward to the continuing conversation on this about the future of New York. And I thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Cerullo. And with that, I'm going to let that be the final word. We have a long agenda. But again, Carolyn, Kyle, Matt, thank you for all of your great work on this. We look forward to building on it in the future. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thanks for okay. having us. Thank you. Ryan, uh, let's go to our Manhattan certification and let's get this uh, uh, the, the, tech, the technical elements of our meeting underway. Certainly. Uh, so the first item on our agenda is a certification of a site selection and acquisition in Manhattan Community District 4. And our presenter is Andy Cantu. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Jeff, can we go to slide two, please? There we go. Uh, so the fire department and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services are requesting a combined site selection and site acquisition action to facilitate the relocation of emergency medical services station seven from a temporary location underneath the high line at 23rd street and 10th avenue to a new state-of-the-art facility at 613 west 29th street in manhattan community district four next slide the proposed action would facilitate the development of an approximately 18,000 square foot three-story ems station enough space to support nine emergency vehicles, approximately 65 to 80 employees, and 18 accessory parking spaces. EMS Battalion 7 covers a service area of about 175 blocks from 45th Street to the north, 14th Street to the south, 5th Avenue to the east, and the Hudson River to the west. The modern and larger EMS facility will help meet the FDNY's station requirements and maintain and enhance the unit's overall operational capabilities. The development site is part of the same zoning lot as the 60 story 300 and sorry, excuse me, 938 unit residential project known as 601 West 29th Street, uh, or recently rebranded as 311, uh, which is nearing completion. And you can see that on the right hand photo uh, under construction. Uh, by current estimates, though, the EMS station itself uh, is not proposed to be built until 2034. Uh, and I'll speak about why that is in a little bit. Next slide. Uh, just to orient everyone, this is a view looking east. The development site is located at the border between West Chelsea and Hudson Yards on the far west side of the block, bounded by West 29th and 30th Streets and 11th Avenue and the West Side Highway. The development site is a 12,500 square foot vacant parcel of land located on the far western side of Lot 12. The eastern portion of Lot 12, like I mentioned, contains the nearly completed 311 project. The site is one block inland from Hudson River Park, and the entrance to the 7 train is located about four blocks to the north. Next slide. Land uses in the vicinity are highly varied and include high-density commercial multifamily and mixed uses, which you can see in red, orange, and brown, uh, especially east of 11th Avenue. Public transportation and parking uses are typically shown in grays. So immediately to the north, you have the Western Rail Yard segment of Hudson Yards, uh, which is still an open cut train yard. 
Uh, and immediately to the south is a full block Con Ed facility uh, and other utilities and industrial uses are shown in pinks and purples. The eastern portion of the block, uh, even though it's, excuse me, western portion of the block, even though it's purple is actually a, a surface parking lot. Next slide. Zoning districts in the uh, surrounding area include high density C6 commercial districts and moderate to high intensity manufacturing districts. The development site itself is located in a C64X commercial district, which typically allows a wide range of residential, commercial, and community facility uses up to 12 FAR with inclusionary housing. However, this C64X district is coextensive with a special Hudson River Park district, uh, which modifies the bulk regulations of the underlying zoning. So the maximum base FAR with MIH is 10, which can then be increased up to 12 FAR only through a transfer of floor area from the Hudson River Park pursuant to a, a CPC special permit. Next slide. Uh, so as some of you will remember, the proposed action is the latest in a long series of planning initiatives for this block. Public facilities have been part of the uh, conversation here for many decades. Block 675 was originally contemplated to be part of the 2005 Hudson Yards rezoning as a shared Department of Sanitation garage uh, and Police Department tow pound with a park located above. Uh, but since the rezoning, uh, public facility needs and plans have shifted and the city ended up not acquiring any sites on this block. In 2013, Community Board 4 and DCP each independently undertook studies which envisioned higher density and affordable housing on Block 675, as well as some form of public service establishment. In 2017, DCP released a planning framework, the goals for which included crafting a vision for appropriate uses, density, massing, and urban design for the block, establishing parameters to inform the review of future private land use applications, and supporting the targeted expansion of the special Hudson River Park District uh, in order to generate additional funds to support ongoing uh, maintenance and operations for the park. Uh, in 2017, importantly, the US Department of Transportation released its preferred alternative alignment for the Trans-Hudson Gateway Tunnel Project, which identified the western portion of the block uh, as an area where the tunnel, uh, a portion of the tunnel and air shaft will go, uh, and the development site itself was identified as a construction staging area. Then in 2018, the city and the property owner, Douglaston Development, reached an agreement to locate an EMS facility on the site. Douglaston secured several approvals, including mapping Lot 12 as a special Hudson River Park District receiving site and Piers 59, 60, and 61 as a granting site, as well as a CPC special permit. The special permit allowed for the distribution of development rights from the piers to Lot 12, allowing the development to reach 12 FAR. The exemption of up to 18,500 square feet of floor area for an EMS facility, as well as allowing 18 accessory off street parking spaces. And then when the actions were approved in 2018, it was contemplated that the city would apply for site selection and acquisition actions in the future, which brings us to today. Next slide. So on your left is a street view of the existing temporary location. Uh, and on your right is a map showing the locations of the existing facility at West 23rd Street at the bottom and the proposed new location on West 29th Street at the top. Uh, as part of their recommendations on the 2018 applications, Community Board 4 and the Manhattan Borough President encouraged the city and the applicant to work together to relocate the existing 5,000 square foot station located in a construction trailer under the High Line to an enclosed space in the proposed 601 West 29th Street project. In its consideration, the commission found that the special permit was appropriate and necessary to accommodate an essential municipal facility uh, that would provide critical emergency medical services to rapidly growing neighborhoods on the west side. Given current and anticipated growth in the Hell's Kitchen, West Chelsea and Hudson Yards neighborhoods, FDNY has uh, long identified a need for a new and expanded EMS station um, however, like I said, the current station is over capacity and additional units and tours at this point uh, just can't be added. Uh, in addition, nearby residents and elected officials have complained that ambulance sirens and fumes from idling vehicles have impacted their quality of life. Uh, and the, propo 
excuse me, proposed facility will have adequate space to park vehicles uh, so they won't need to idle. Next slide. This is a view of the uh, 12,500 square foot development site looking northeast along 29th Street. Uh, it's currently used as uh, surface parking and staging for the 311 project. Next slide. And here's a view looking down West 29th Street from the intersection with 11th Avenue. West 29th is a one-way westbound roadway which operates with one to two travel lanes with a bike lane. At 60 feet, 29th is a narrow street with a curb to curb width of approximately 32 feet. Next slide. Uh, so this is a basic site plan sort of showing the development site uh, on the vacant parcel on the mid block within the context of the larger uh, 311 development and the yellow outline is uh, lot 12. The parcel itself, the development site, has 125 feet of frontage along West 29th Street and is approximately 99 feet deep. As proposed, the three-story building will have a height of approximately 43 feet and contain a two-bay apparatus floor with enough space for nine emergency response vehicles, offices, classrooms, locker rooms, kitchen and dining spaces, and other support facilities. The apparatus bay would be accessed by a 44 foot wide curb cut, while the employee parking area would be accessed by a 22 foot wide curb cut. Next slide. As part of the construction on the new Trans Hudson Rail Tunnel, Amtrak holds a construction easement on the undeveloped portion of lot 12 until 2032. Construction of the proposed EMS station is expected to begin after the easement is extinguished and anticipated to be completed in about 2034, uh, lasting about 18 months. Next slide. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks uh, very much, Andy. So uh, I only have one, and uh, just, to, just for the clarity of, uh, of the group. So if there's a construction easement until 2032, work will take 18 months thereafter. We are in 2022. What, 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 it, what prompts uh, the, the need to have this conversation uh, today as opposed to at some point in the future? Right. So in order to negotiate all of these agreements with Amtrak, the city needs site control uh, of the of the. 12,500 square foot development site, uh, which is why we're asking for your approval for uh, site acquisition. Got it. Okay, uh, let's go to Commissioner Bernie. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Andrew, for the presentation. Uh, I mean, just to follow up on the chair's question, so it takes 10 years to do that? It seems an inordinate amount of time, considering how badly they need this facility. Does it really have to wait until 2034? So the, if a, the construction easement is for the Trans-Hudson uh, rail tunnel. So that's going to be the total construction timeline for um, everything that's going under uh, the Hudson River. And that includes, uh, and that I understand is still in the engineering phases, excuse me. Um, so the, the construction staging is not for, um, the next door residential project. Um, it's just to house, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the facilities for the actual gateway tunnel. Right, but I don't I understand. I understand, yeah, that, I mean. It, Why does that preclude building a EMS station? I'm sorry? I, I don't understand why there couldn't be very quick agreement to go ahead and build the EMS station. It doesn't sound as though there's an engineering problem or a technical problem that would interfere. They could just give the, over the approval and you could build your EMS station. Right, well, Amtrak needs the actual land to put um, vehicles and equipment for the tunnel project. Oh, so they say they need the site. In order exactly, to yes. And Sorry no if that wasn't clear. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see. So my second question was, because uh, I've got some experience with these EMS stations, uh, in addition to the emergency vehicles, the ambulances, 
everybody that works at that station has a car typically and they need places to park their cars so is parking for the personnel being provided as well the 18 accessory parking spaces are for the employees and are they where are they in relation to the building then are they adjacent to the building or i didn't see them on the snack line um jeff if we could go to so the you you won't the the site plan um so the drawings are actually illustrative um you won't actually be approving the design of the building itself but jeff if we could go to slide um let's see 21 i think in the appendix um i believe the employee parking is designed to be on the second floor So the first floor would actually be sort of like the emergency bay apparatus where the vehicles, the actual EMS vehicles are parked. Um, and then the employee parking would be accessed um, from the ground floor, but then you would drive up to the second floor. Wow, that's that's new and different. They didn't used to do that with the EMS station program. <laughs> so <laughs> they're getting a special station here. That's that's good. OK, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to ask this question, given how long this is deferred, but, but I'll ask it anyway. Is, is ultimately, would EMS be a lessee or would they own the site? Um, ultimately, the, the city will, will own the site. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, Commissioner Marine. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have but two questions. The first is relative to the parking where we discussed the amount of parking, 18 parking spots. How many employees are actually anticipated to be at the station during a shift? I believe um, between 65 and 80. I think 65 is sort of like the average number. And 80 is the maximum. And does EMS feel that the 16 or 18 parking spots are sufficient? Um, yes. Uh, you know, I Andrew, so. I, I would check that, Andrew. I don't think that sounds like a lot for a single shift. That's probably three shifts. Those numbers you just quoted. From my experience with the EMS station, there are not 80 people there in one shift, I don't think, unless this is a very busy station. I'll, I'll definitely go back which and was, check that for you. Yeah, which which I was, I was asking by shift, because people are going to come in and park and then leave. So if there's 60, throughout the day and it seems like maybe it's two for six 20 per 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 shift and that seems reasonable but then that brings me to my next question okay. sorry excuse me i'm looking at, I'm looking at the, the memo again and so it, it would be 65 to 80 employees total so you're right a shift would be about you know uh, a quarter to a third of that I yeah apologize. That, that, that sounds more like it yes so you know understanding as well that where we are in terms of the city and its growth and projecting that the station will be built 10 years out, do we feel that the station will be able to support the number of people that are projected in 10 years to be both working and living in that community? Or in uh, that service area, let me put it that way. I'm going to defer that question to the FDNY when they, when they come back. I think it'd be better for them to answer, but I've asked them that question. I, I think that would be interesting to know. Right, I've asked them that question and, and they believe that it, at this point, this station as designed, as proposed, will be able to fulfill its mission, but I'll let them elaborate. So I, I guess my final question then would be, Andy, how, how, does that, how does that station fare with today's population in terms of service calls and activity in the, in, in the service area? I'm sorry, say that again, Commissioner? Currently, does this EMS station for its service area, provide enough services, or is it lacking in services, or or? Um, are you? Do you mean the existing station that's under the High Line? That is correct. So, and, and well, I, I'm actually looking to pin together the number of employees currently to the community, and how is that serving? How that works? The current 80 employees. Base, and then, of course, I'm, I'm looking at the projection of all these folks coming in in the future to the Hudson Yard. So it seems it doesn't seem like it's paired well. So I'd, I'd, I'd like more information on that when they come when it comes back again. I don't think we can get an answer today. 
we, we will pursue that for you, Commissioner. I think it's a good question. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. We appreciate it. Um, uh, with that, uh, this, uh, this item is uh, certified and we will, of course, uh, be seeing it down the line. So thanks to you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and I'm going to have Ryan move us on to the next item. Certainly. Uh, the second item on our agenda is a certification of a city map change in the Bronx Community District 10. And our presenter is Philip Montgomery. Hello. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. For certification is an application by Throgs Neck Associates LLC seeking an amendment to the city map. Uh, the proposed amendment involves the elimination, discontinuous, and closing of a portion of Meyer Street between East Tremont Avenue and Edison Avenue in the Bronx Community District 10. Uh, the proposed amendment in conjunction with previously certified land use applications would facilitate the development of new mixed use commercial and residential buildings. Next slide. The proposed city map amendment that is the subject of this application is requested in connection with the Bruckner Sites rezoning project, which includes a series of land use, land use actions, including zoning map and zoning tech text amendments which were certified into ULARP on March 28th, 2022 and are uh, returning for pre-hearing review later. Together, the land use actions would facilitate the development of four new mixed use commercial and residential building, buildings on sites A through D, including a proposed building on site B, which includes the portion of Meyer Street that is proposed to be demapped. Next slide, please. The project area is located in the Schuylerville neighborhood of the Bronx within Community District 10. The surrounding area is characterized by a mix of predominantly residential use with commercial uses concentrated along portions of Bruckner Boulevard and East Tremont Avenue. The project area is pr presently zoned R4A with a C12 overlay and is served by public transit, including the BX-5, BX-8, BX-40, and Q-5 bus lines. Next slide, please. Here is an aerial view of the project area with the area outlined in red being the uh, proposed uh, street map. Next slide, please. Meyer Street between East Tremont Avenue and Edison Avenue is a mapped but unbuilt street and has never been built or used for vehicular through traffic. It is mapped to an irregular width and is both partially city and privately owned. Uh, the subject portion of Meyer Street proposed to be demapped is privately owned, mapped to a width of 50 feet and extends approximately 110 feet westward from Edison Avenue and is approximately 5,500 uh, square feet in, in area. Next slide, please. This is a more detailed drawing showing the limits of Meyer Street uh, that is uh, proposed to be demapped. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, this is a view of the proposed demapped portion of Meyer Street facing eastwards towards Edison Avenue. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Um, I just, we, we are about in a moment to go to a pre-hearing review of the Rockner sites uh, rezoning, which is the, and we, we of course, as a commission have seen this before uh, when we certified it, but that's the proposal for the development of the four new mixed use uh, buildings with 339 units. Th this, demapping proposal appears to be on a different timetable and schedule, although it also does seem to be rather significantly connected uh, to the rest of it. Can you just uh, uh, say a little bit more about why it is not part of the same uh, set of actions that we're going to be hearing on Wednesday? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, it, it it was intended to, all of the actions were it, it intended to move together. Uh, there were some delays regarding the mapping application. It didn't just quite uh, uh, 
align with the other applications and the applicant uh, decided to move forward with the zoning applications first with the, uh, the, the thoughts and the intent that the mapping application would uh, uh, you know, catch up. But yes, they were all intended to be packaged together. Is there anything about the, when we, we have our hearing on Wednesday on the four sites, is there anything that we should be keeping in mind as it relates to this um, mapped street, privately owned, but mapped street, uh, or can all of the proposals be otherwise effectuated, even if this is not ultimately approved? I asked just so we, we know what the dynamic or what the, the, the guardrails of this dynamic are here. How, how far can we go in any direction? Yes, the, the, the other actions can be approved. The, the city map change, uh, it could actually stand alone, uh, even if not a, a, a part of the other uh, actions that are going to be bef before you. Uh, it, uh, it would clear title for the applicant's property and you know, that they could potentially build as of right on it. Uh, so it, they could stand alone as they are. It, I, I understand that the, the, the mapping action could stand alone. Could the development action, which I'm sorry, which site is this one on? It's on three, which, which site is this one on? Site, uh, site B. Site B, I'm sorry, Site B. So could Site B proceed as it is currently anticipated without the mapping action or does it need the mapping action to be able to proceed as it's proposed? I would. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in here too. because I, I know we're gonna be talking about this with the next set. Um, the, again, both actions could you know, function and are both rational independently. It would change the footprint um, of site B, um, uh, you know, within the, the confines of the area that's mapped, they would not be able to build over this portion of that. So it would change the footprint. Um, what is being shown is um, taking into consideration uh, the the unmapped street. So it would change the footprint, but there's still it's still a buildable site, certainly. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions on this one, uh, this item is certified and we're gonna now move on to what will be a familiar topic also in the Bronx, hmm. Ryan. Yeah, so this is the third item. It's uh, the pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in the Bronx Community District 10. Our presenter is Alexandra Patty Diaz. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is the Brogner site's rezoning, seeking to facilitate for new developments to produce approximately 300 units, along with local retail and community spaces. Next, in Skyler Real neighborhood, Community District 10 in the Bronx, the overall project area is located on the northern side of Brogner Boulevard, between Crosby Avenue to the east and Balcon Avenue to the west. Next. The applicant, Throsk Neck Associates LLC, seeks a zoning map amendment and a zoning tax amendment to facilitate the following developments. Next. Site A is located at 2945 Bruckner Boulevard and will contain a new story, a new eight-story mixed-use residential and commercial building with approximately 14200 square feet of floor area. The first floor will contain approximately 17,000 square foot of a grocery store, which will replace the existing one on site. The rest of the floors will contain approximately 139 dwelling units, of which 41 will remain permanently affordable under MIH program option two. Additionally, there will be another recreational space and that will be accessible for residents as well as 190 parking spaces. Through Euler, the applicant has made some uh, changes to this project as they have incorporated three bedroom units um, 
site A will now is proposed to include 126 units of which approximately 38 will be become permanently affordable. The project will be privately financed and will request no governance subsidy for the generation of the affordable units as stated by the applicant. Next. Site B is comprising several lots located in the intersection between the Brockner Boulevard and Edison Avenue and will contain a new five-story mixed residential and commercial building with approximately 101,000 square feet of floor area. The first floor will contain approximately 23,000 square feet of community facility and recreational facilities for the youth. And there will be also a space for local retail. The rest of the floors will contain approximately 114 dwelling units of which 30 units will remain permanently affordable on the MIH program option two. There will be 75 parking spaces. Through ULERP, the applicant has made some changes as well. It incorporated three bedroom units and site B is now to include 102 units of which 31 will be permanently affordable. Additionally, it will include a sports and recreation center and or an after school to tutoring center uh, as her as a need uh, by the community. It, this project will be privately financed and will request no government subsidy for the generation of the affordable housing units. Next, as stated in the previous item, this development will be facilitated by a uh, a change in the city map to the map, a map on Build Street located in Mayor Street between Edison and East Tremont Avenues. Together with the land use actions proposed in this application, they will facilitate um, the development as mentioned before. Next. Site C uh, is comprised of several lots, and it's a corner lot located in the intersection between Brockner Boulevard and Revere Avenue, and will contain, it's proposed to contain a new eight-story mixed residential and commercial building with approximately 63,000 square feet of floor area. The first floor will contain approximately 13,000 square feet of office space, and the rest of the floors will contain 64 dwelling units, of which 19 will remain permanently affordable uh, pursuant to the MIH program option two. There will be 29 enclosed parking spaces. Through ULERB, uh, the applicant also made changes in this site. Um, site C will now include 100% affordable senior housing units in accordance with the city's current uh, SARA term sheets. And it will include nine, 99 Sorry, it will include 99 units of which 30 will become permanently affordable. Next, site D is comprised of, uh, is comprised of several lots in the northern side of Brogner Boulevard between Balcom and Quincy Avenue. It will contain a new three-story residential building with approximately 16,000 square feet of floor area. This building uh, will produce 22 dwelling units and nine parking spaces. Through ULERP, the applicant uh, made changes and now uh, they the team uh, partner would tunnel to Towers Foundation to provide the 22 units uh, for veterans. Next. Stated before, all these developments will be facilitated by the following land use actions. The applicant is requesting zoning map amendment to change from existing lower density districts, such as R4A C12, R4A, R41C24, and R41, to uh, contextual medium density districts, R6A C24 and R6A. And also from an existing lower density district, R41, to a contextual lower density district, R5B with a C24 overlay. Next, 
coterminous of the area to be uh, changed as an R6A district, which is the one between Crosby and Revere Avenues. The applicant is proposing to modify this uh, Appendix F of the Sony resolution to establish an MRH area with options one and two over that area. Next. This application was certified by the Commission and uh, by the Department of City Planning in March 28th. Then it was uh, sent to the community board with help, that held two meetings and one public hearing in May 19 of 22 and recommended to disapprove the application with 24 votes in favor and one against and zero abstaining. Uh, the letter explaining uh, their arguments uh, was also added in your package. I um, also want to uh, make you aware that so far uh, the department has received 59 letters from the community in the majority stating opposition to the project. Uh, we have included samples of the letters uh, in your package. And additionally, uh, we have received 100 public comments that have been submitting ahead of the public hearing. The board president held two hearings uh, last week in June 21st and June 22nd. At the time we prepared this presentation, we didn't have uh, the recom uh, her recommendations. We received it this morning, which we um, added also um, into your communications. As we go through the recommendations uh, today, um, we can tell you that the borough president um, approved the application with conditions. And we can discuss in a further uh, session. And the City Planning Commission uh, public hearing is scheduled for next Wednesday. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, I, I only have one, and then we'll go to uh, other commissioners if they have. Um, so this, uh, this community, obviously, it had a pretty strong... Uh, uh, no vote on the community board level. Tell how how is this neighborhood doing on affordable housing construction uh, generally? Have they kept up with the rest of the city, or uh, what's the what's the situation in this uh, in this community board? Sean, can you take this? Sure, of course. Uh, actually, community board ten has one of the the lowest production rates of affordable housing in the city. Um, and hasn't seen significant affordable, affordable housing in, in, in recent years. Okay. Um, so not a huge number of overall units as being proposed here, but any number of affordable units would, sounds like would be a, uh, a, a, a change for, uh, for the neighborhood, certainly as we're thinking about um, uh, how to build affordable units throughout the city. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, that this is uh, an opportunity that is shared uh, all around. So I, I do. I, I think that's an important uh, point to note, Sean. So thank you for for, for pointing that out. Um, okay. All right. Let me uh, let me see. Uh, okay, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. So, Alexandra, I'd be interested to hear from the applicant how the expiration of 421A has impacted the uh, financial feasibility of the project. I know you mentioned several times that there was no subsidies. And I, I can't imagine that this project could be underwritten with a um, market rate component and an affordable component without 421A. So a uh, couple of questions to the applicant for uh, Wednesday. Uh, a, what, how has it impacted them? Um, and maybe perhaps they already vested, I don't know if they have foundations and they have to visit the site, but is there is what will be the impact of the expiration of 421A and what are their plans uh, to to mitigate that. Thank you. Okay, the applicant will uh, hope the, uh, address that. Exactly. If you have any information currently, that would be. Uh, in terms of, uh, I I don't have any other finance uh, finance information about the project. Uh, in terms of any foundations on site, uh, the last time I was there, which was in one of the community meetings, I. 
I, I checked the sites myself and they are in the conditions that were stated um, in the briefing package. Uh, vacant, uh, some, uh, some um, uh, bu existing buildings, the supermarket, it didn't seem that uh, nothing has been happening or was happening there, but um, the applicant can give you more details on Wednesday. I would say that's right. And the only the only thing I, I would add is that one of the changes is now the applicant is pursuing uh, HPD subsidy for the senior building. And so that they will have subsidy for is it, is it side so C? Yeah. Yes, side C. Mm -hmm. Correct. But the other you, you the other uh, ones. Yeah, the other ones on, on a letter that uh, in response to the community boards that was sent to me by the applicant, like uh, it's responding that site A and B will be financed privately, completely. Site C would subsidize from HPD and we learned today that they already contacted HPD and there were no major flags. And the same for site D is going to be also privately funded in, in conjunction with tunnels to towers. Um, but any other you know, detail on that, I think they can share it on Wednesday. We Thank don't you. have it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Marin. Thank you. <clears throat> so I too was gonna ask about affordable housing chair. So thank you for pausing that question. My, my other questions also circulate around the issue of subsidy. So it's not just a 421A or a senior subsidy that's available from HPD. And I think that there are other subsidies that are available, just questioning as to why the applicant wouldn't take advantage of those, but I certainly applaud them if that's the position they wanna take. Um, I, I, I wanna talk about two sites specifically, I, I, I'm not opposed too much to what's being proposed for site C, which is a senior housing. I do think the building is out of context, however, understanding the population we're serving and actually where the building sits is not in such an area where it would create such, oppose such a problem for the community. I'm okay with that height at the moment. Um, building A, I would posit, that's where the supermarket is gonna go. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So one of the things that, that I've heard and I've read and, and you may have confirmed or not was the viability of that, of that grocery store because there are 850,000 people in the community as identified and it was further stated that about 2,000 people frequent that supermarket daily. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit remiss to understand how that supermarket is functioning now and how it anticipates it will continue to function just because new, new housing is being brought in. On the bulk of that building, I would posit that, you know, I've read the borough president's report, but even before then, I had a chance to tour the neighborhood and, and take a look at it. Um, I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. And so, you know, I think that the 85 foot high there is, that's the R6A that they're proposing. I, I would wonder what the, what the applicant would think of an R6B with a 55 foot height which is actually in line with the school that's adjacent there. And it's also in line with, it's somewhat in line with the current homes because as we know, you know, they're single family homes, but these homes are three stories tall with attics, which give you at about 35, 40, 40 foot height, which would sort of pair well with an R6B community. Um, and then of course, the most important question would be, what happens during the supermarket's exit where do its employees go and are they um, secured of, a, of employment leaving this food town, maybe going to another and coming back? That, that would be interesting to know because we, we would be losing jobs. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is the bulk of my question. I'm sure I'll have some more by, by Wednesday. Um, we did just receive the borough president's report this morning. So yes. for now. Um, I will leave to the applicant explain everything about the supermarket uh, since I know they have been uh, giving uh, input and comments and their plan uh, for the employees between uh, construction of both. But their plan is to uh, keep the, just it is also to update the current supermarket to their needs. So I think like uh, hearing that from them will be very important on Wednesday. Um, and regarding to your thoughts on heights and so and the proposal in district on site A, um, I 
again, we're still going through the comments of the BP's uh, office, uh, but your thoughts uh, and, your, and your line of thought uh, on it is very similar to hers. Part of the conditions that she included in the letter was that for this project area to be modified from R6A to R6B, uh, very close with the arguments that you share about context um, and the need or not of, of that height and building and that location. But only for that, uh, she also shared uh, some thoughts about CIC, but understanding will be a senior, uh, she feel more comfortable there. But again, we will go deeper into the BP's recs uh, when we come back for post hearing follow up. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate it. Yes. Alejandra, perdón. <laughs> it, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let, me, let me go to uh, Commissioner Bernie. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alejandra, at the last time we saw this, um, I made a comment about the illustration of the building on site D that didn't seem to make sense in terms of a three-story residential building. And I yes. was asking if they could provide us some plans of how the building actually worked. And in fact, we didn't get any plans for the other buildings either. So I'm hoping uh, when we see it on Wednesday that they'll be able to fill us in a bit more on the actual design of the buildings. Yeah, um, I believe um, they will share updates okay. on, the, on the drawings. And um, we also suggested for them to um, come with an aerial with the buildings uh, in Photoshop in the context, which I think will all help us understand the proposal even more. Yeah, yeah, particularly mm -hmm. the ground floor plans would be, ground floor plans would be important too, so. Terrific, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Ali. Thank you uh, very much. Um, commissioners, uh, this one we're going to see again soon. We'll have it at a public hearing, and I know that it will, uh, we'll have uh, members of the community um, coming to talk to us about it, so we'll look forward to that. Uh, so this one goes to a public hearing for Wednesday the 29th. Thank you again. Uh, and we're now going to go to a pre-hearing matter in Brooklyn. Great. Yes, the fourth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a notice of intent to acquire office space in Brooklyn Community District 2. Uh, Amritha Mahesh is our presenter. Good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. This is a notice of intent to acquire office space by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the Office of Court Administration pursuant to Section 195 of the New York City Charter to acquire office space at 1 Willoughby Square in downtown Brooklyn, Community District 2, Brooklyn. Next slide. The acquisition of this space will be used for the offices of the New York State Office of Court Administration, currently located at 141 Livingston Street, also in downtown Brooklyn. The appellate term second judicial department is comprised of two separate courts, one of which serves the Kings, Queens, and Richmond counties, and the other that serves the Suffolk and Nassau counties. The courts share common non-judicial staff at the OCA, consisting of approximately 40 employees, including attorneys, court officers, IT personnel, clerks, and various clerical staff. Next slide. The OCA appellate term is proposing to relocate to one Willoughby Square shown here in yellow, roughly four blocks from its current location at 141 Livingston Street shown here in blue. The proposed relocation is in response to the private owner of 141 Livingston Street not renewing OCA's lease when it expires in 2025. The proposed relocation is optimal because the office space is in close proximity to the court buildings that the OCA appellate term staff interact with frequently, shown here in, in pink, such as the uh, Kings County Supreme Court, New York City Criminal Court and Civil Court, and the Appellate Division Second Department. The area has excellent transit access with 13 subway lines within blocks of the proposed location. Several bus lines make stops along the nearby Fulton Street, DeKalb Avenue, and Livingston Street corridors as well. The area is also well served by city bike stations. Next slide. One Willoughby Square is a mid-block building bounded by Alby Square West to the east, Duffield Street to the west, 
Willoughby Street to the north and Fulton Street to the south. The surrounding area is characterized by a mix of predominantly high density commercial and residential uses with ground floor retail, institutional uses, as well as civic uses, including federal, state, and local municipal offices. Fulton Mall is a major retail corridor drawing visitors from across the borough. The site is also in close proximity to the City Point mixed use development, which includes mixed income housing and destination retail uses. The site is located within the special downtown Brooklyn district. The special district is mapped primarily with high density commercial zoning districts, which allow for a mix of uses up to 10 to 12 FAR. The project site is located in a C6 4.5 district. Next slide. One Willoughby Square is a new 35 story, approximately 393,000 square foot office building that was completed in June of 2021. As the commission may recall, the building was the result of a city led effort and public private partnership to promote the creation of office space in downtown Brooklyn. One Willoughby Square also includes space for a new 300 seat elementary school within the base of the building anticipated to open in September 2023. It should be noted that the site is part of the Brooklyn Center Urban Renewal Plan established in August of 1970. The building is part of the URP site 19B and is subject to special requirements for bulk and use. In 2016, the CPC approved a minor change to the fifth amended URP that waived bulk controls for Site 19B to facilitate the development of One Willoughby Square. The fifth amended URP expires in July of 2044. Next slide. Here is a street view along Duffield Street looking south. Seen here is the main entrance and lobby servicing the office uses. Next slide. Here is another view from Alby Square West looking north. The City Point development is seen to the right of the image. Next slide. The offices would be accessed through the main entrance and elevator banks along the Duffield Street frontage. OCA is proposing to lease the entire 10th and 11th floors for a total of approximately 29,000 square feet. Next slide. Each floor is approximately 14,500 square feet. The space will accommodate approximately 43 full-time employees on a daily basis. OCA staff will have access 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The new space will have administrative offices, a muster room, a conference room, locker rooms, a pantry, meeting room, file room, law library, restrooms, and a break area for the staff. The building will be ADA compliant. The space will be open to the public from Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. OCA estimates that 30 to 35 people from the public uh, would visit the office on a daily basis. The court will provide its own security for floors 10 and 11, which will have magnetometers and x-ray machines for screening court users. OCA intends to acquire a few off-street parking spaces utilizing their procurement process. This is in an effort to support the streetscape and pedestrianization goals of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnerships Public Realm Action Plan. Next slide. The application materials include responses to how the proposed office space meets the consideration of the applicable fair share criteria. Pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter, the notice of intent was referred to Brooklyn Community Board 2 and all borough precedents on June 16th. The department has not yet received any recommendations. That concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Let me see if there are questions here. Commissioner Rampershed. Uh, thank you and thank you for the presentation. Just two quick questions. Uh, what are the terms of the lease? Uh, how long is it for? And what is the projected build out? Because the current lease is expiring in 2025. That's so right. do, you, do they have a timeline in terms of the projected build out? The lease term is the standard 20 year period. Um, and that's right. The current space, uh, the lease expires in 2025. Um, I can relay the question about the build out timeline to DCAS staff who can address it um, on Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, okay, seeing no other questions on this one, we're gonna send it to a public hearing on Wednesday. Amrita, thank you very much as always. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let us move on to the next item. Uh, Ryan, I think we're moving to a new borough here. Yeah, uh, so the fifth item on our agenda is a preview and review of a notice of intent to acquire office space in Queens Community District 9 and Scott Solomon will present. Great, great. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, chair. We'll move on to the next slide. The notice of intent to acquire office space pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter, Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the Queens County District Attorney's Office are proposing to acquire 3,870 square feet of additional office space at 8002 Q Gardens Road in the Q Gardens neighborhood in Queens Community District 9. Additional space is to help alleviate the Queens DA's overcrowded conditions and its existing office space currently dispersed among uh, four different buildings in the area. Next slide. Uh, the proposed office space is located in a portion of the seventh floor of 8002 Q Gardens Road, located within a C44 zoning district. The building is located near Queens Boulevard, a major east-west thoroughfare, an active corridor of retail and low to high density office, mixed use and residential buildings. Along with significant office, community facility and retail presence, there is also an important civic center with a large presence of federal, uh, state and city agencies located in both private and public buildings. The subject property is a private office building that fronts Q Gardens Road to the north and is further bounded by 80th to the east, Union Turnpike to the west, and residential buildings to the south. The area is well served by public transportation with the Kew Gardens Union Turnpike subway station with access to the E and F subway lines located adjacent to the building with an entrance located just outside the building's primary pedestrian entrance on Kew Gardens Road. Uh, vehicular access to a cellar parking garage is located at 80th Road with egress on Union Turnpike. Next slide. The building is a 12-story, approximately 514,000 square foot office building. It's highlighted in yellow above. Uh, the Queens County DA's office currently occupies approximately 101,000 square feet of the building. The staff is located on the basement level, the entire first and eighth floors, and a portion of the second, fourth, fifth, seventh, and eighth floors. The building has a variety of private tenants, as well as federal and state eight, uh, government agencies. Currently, Queens DA staff are dispersed among four separate office buildings scattered along Queens Boulevard. The office's original facility within the Queens uh, Criminal Court Complex at 12501 Queens Boulevard. Office facilities on various floors and wings of Queens Borough Hall at 12055 Queens Boulevard. Rental space at 12606 Queens Boulevard and rental space in 8002 Queen Q Gardens Road, subject property. So those uh, additional buildings are on the green above. A previous 195 application was completed in 1993 for the Queen's DA's use of office space uh, at the subject property. Next slide. Uh, the proposed additional office space, totaling again 3,870 square feet, located on a portion of the seventh floor of the building, would be utilized to accommodate additional assistant district attorneys and support staff. Uh, due to the fragmented location of the offices currently, oftentimes staff are not located in the same floor or even the same building as their supervisors or co-workers, which has caused some serious logistical difficulties for the DA's office. Uh, the requested space would help alleviate a portion of these issues. Next slide. So to facilitate the acquisition of the additional office space, DCAS and the Queens DA office, submit jointly the notice of intent to acquire office space pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter. Uh, thanks, thank you. And this concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions. And on Wednesday, both the Queens DA office and DCAS will be present for any questions as, in addition to their presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Scott. Let's see if there are questions here on the Queens DA office space. Now this does not, uh, this does not allow them to fully consolidate all their folks. This just adds a little bit more uh, space for them to be able to use, but it sounds like they're, they're still going to continue to be um, uh, spread out Correct. Uh, here and there, right? Uh, correct, Chair. Uh, this will allow them to consolidate within that building, uh, but they still have this issue of dispersal of, of staff amongst these four buildings. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, 
you're muted, Vice Chair. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, Scott, is this a, uh, a, a 20 year uh, lease proposal? So it, the, the new space is being uh, absorbed into an existing lease that ends in 2031. Uh, and it, has, it was amended to include space since the original 1993 lease. And then they also have two five year uh, renewal options that will take them to 2041 if, if the DA's office would so choose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll send this one off to a public hearing on Wednesday the 29th. Ryan, let's go to our network. There's a lot of office space today. Yep. Yeah. A lot of space. Let's go to the next one. The sixth item on our agenda, pre-hearing review for notice of intent to acquire office space in Queens Community District 12. Uh, in his first presentation to the City Planning Commission is Andrew Sabuin. Andrew. Good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. This is a pre-hearing presentation for an application from the New York City Law Department's Family Court Division and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS, for the acquisition of 24,000 square feet of office space. The project area is located at 162-10 Jamaica Avenue in downtown Jamaica, Queens Community District 12. The Family Court Division requires new office space to accommodate additional staff capacity after the passing of New York State's Raise the Age Initiative in 2017, which ensures that young people in New York who commit nonviolent crimes receive the intervention and evidence-based treatment they need. The office space would house 57 staff. The Law Department has been authorized by New York City Office of Management and Budget to acquire office space for the expanded need. And in 2019, DCAS executed a license agreement for the same space for which DCAS is now seeking to execute a lease. Next slide, please. This is the second application that the applicant team has filed for the space. The first application was filed on November 4th, 2021, and the CPC voted to approve it on December 1st, but the applicant team withdrew the application on December 6th. The applicant team submitted a newly filed land use application on June 16, 2022, Note that the new applications, proposed actions, and programmatic details are the same as those provided in the original application. Next slide, please. Depicted by the star on the map, the project area is located within downtown Jamaica, one of Queen's primary central business districts, as one of the city's hubs for courts. Reflecting the Family Court Division's locational requirements, the project area is within three blocks of the main Queen's Family Court building, and is less than a mile from the Queens County Supreme Court and the New York City Civil Court. The project area is located on Jamaica Avenue, which serves as downtown Jamaica's primary east-west thoroughfare. The project area is well served by public transit and is accessible via 15 bus lines and four subway lines. The E, J, and Z lines are located within two blocks west of the project area and the F line at Parsons Boulevard and Hillside Avenue is located six blocks to the north. The project area sits directly north of the Long Island Railroad tracks, and the Jamaica LIRR station is located less than a mile west of the site. Next slide, please. The project area is located in a C63 zoning, zoning district within the special downtown Jamaica district. C63 districts permit a wide range of high bulk commercial uses, including corporate headquarters, large hotels, department stores, and entertainment venues. These districts are located in New York's commercial cores, including Midtown Manhattan and Downtown Brooklyn. Next slide, please. The project area is bounded by Jamaica Avenue to the north, Guy R. Brewer Boulevard to the east, Archer Avenue to the south, and Union Hall Street to the west. The project area is coterminous with the development site and is outlined here in purple. The surrounding area comprises a wide mix of commercial and institutional uses. Jamaica Avenue to the north is the area's major commercial corridor and is lined with mixed-use buildings, um, colored here in red on the map, containing ground floor retails such as fast casual restaurants, pharmacies, and clothing, sports, uh, clothing stores with office space or residential units above. There are also a few big box stores, multifamily residential buildings covered, uh, colored here in orange, as well as a few houses of worship along with cultural and educational institutions uh, colored in blue. The development site comprises almost all of Block 10102, with frontage along Jamaica Avenue and Union Hall Street. 
Adjacent properties include clothing stores, delis, tax services, healthcare facilities, and other local retail. The office is accessible via an elevator located in the lobby, which has an entrance on Union Hall Street. The rest of the ground floor of Gertz Plaza is comprised of a Primark department store, several smaller retail clothing and shoe stores, beauty supply shops, and convenience stores. Floors two through seven are comprised of office space occupied by nonprofit organizations and government agencies, including the Administration for Children's Services, the City Human Resources Administration, the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, and the State Division of Homes and Community Renewal. Next slide, please. We'll now go on a brief walking tour of the project area. This photo looks east on Union Hall Street towards the office lobby entrance, which has been recently renovated. The proposed law department office itself is located on the fourth floor and accessible via an elevator located in the lobby. Next slide. This photo looks south from Jamaica Avenue towards the building's primary retail frontage. This side provides access to the interior ground floor mall within the building, but not to the offices above. Next slide. This photo looks south from Archer Avenue towards the rear of the building, which serves as its primary loading area. The applicant intends to schedule all receiving drop-offs outside of peak commute hours. Due to the function of the office, the volume of goods received is not expected to be significant. Next slide, please. The office's floor plan, which has been rotated slightly in this image, so north is facing to the left, shows how the office space would be divided. All visitors and staff would enter from Union Hall Street lobby and take the elevator to the fourth floor. They would then enter the office through the main entrance indicated on the plans. The client area shown in blue would be separated from the staff area shown in yellow, which would be accessible using key cards. The client area would consist of the main reception area, six conference rooms and restrooms. The staff area would include approximately 30 offices, two large conference rooms, space for cubicles, a mail room and printer copy areas. Next slide, please. Summarize, the New York City Law Department's Queens Family Court Division and DCAS are seeking to acquire 24,000 square feet of office space within the existing seven-story Gertz Plaza mixed-use commercial and office building in downtown Jamaica. The office will accommodate 57 staff and approximately 1,500 visitors annually. The applicant team will be available to answer questions at Wednesday public hearing, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Terrific. Thank you very much. Congrats on your, uh, your first presentation. Nice work. Uh, Thanks. Let's, uh, let's see if there are questions for you here from the commission. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Seeing none, we'll, uh, we will see the applicant for the public hearing on Wednesday. Uh, Andy, thank you very much again. Congrats. Thanks. Uh, okay, Ryan, let's go to uh, item seven. Yeah, uh, seventh item on our agenda is a post referral review of a renewal of a previously approved special permit in Staten Island Community District One uh, also presenting for the first time to the CPC is Benjamin Pavlovsky. Hello, good afternoon. Good um, afternoon, Ben. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, this is my first presentation to the commission, so excited to be here today. I'm here to discuss with you a renewal action for a proposed development of a 219,000 square foot retail development with accessory parking for 838 cars. The project is called the South Avenue Retail Development, but it's commonly known as the South Avenue BJ's or Graniteville BJ's as BJ's Wholesale is the primary tenant. Next slide, please. The applicant requests the renewal of a prior special permit approved by the commission in 2017 near the Graniteville and Mariners Harbor neighborhoods of Staten Island's Community Board 1. The prior special permit was to allow a retail establishment larger than 10,000 square feet within a proposed multi-building commercial development. The commission can grant a renewal of a special permit for an additional three-year term, provided that they find that the facts upon which the special permit was granted have not substantially changed. The original approval also included a minor amendment to the city map, which I will describe later in the presentation. 
the proposed site plan has not been modified from the original application. Next slide, please. The project site is located at 534 South Avenue, which is located southwest of the corner of Forest Avenue and South Avenue. The site consists of two large parcels, and while it has frontage on both Forest and South Avenues, it does not include the parcels right at the corner of that intersection. Next slide, please. The development site is zoned M11, and the M11 district is contiguous to the north and south. The site is bordered by an M21 district to the west and R32 to the east. The surrounding land uses in the M11 district include a mix of light manufacturing and auto-related businesses, a chain restaurant, a medical facility, and some non-conforming residential uses. To the immediate west in the M21 district on the south side of Forest Avenue is a movie theater. South of the movie theater is the Graniteville Swamp Park, labeled on the map which is a nine acre city owned passive wetland park that is contiguous with the wetland and wetland adjacent area to be preserved um, south of the development site as part of this project. And to the immediate east, the R32 district is developed with low density residential uses and the Forest Avenue retail corridor is a mix of C21 and C22 overlays and C41 and C81 zones with several big box stores and strip mall like buildings. Next slide, please. The, the development site is approximately 1.23 million square feet or 28.3 acres with frontage on both South Avenue and Forest Avenue. As seen in the photos, the applicant has initiated grading and land clearing on the site, which is permitted by the previously approved Department of Buildings or DOB permits. On the left side is a view of current conditions on the site. Um, facing southwest from Lilac Court, which is a spur street from Forest Avenue that dead ends at the edge of the site. On the right side is a view of the site facing east from Morrow Street, adjacent to the movie theater. Next slide, please. In 2017, the commission granted approval of a special permit that is the subject of this renewal. An amendment to the city map was also part of the original approval in order to complete the following two objectives. One, to improve access by realigning Morrow Street so it lines up with the existing signalized intersection at the entrance to Home Depot across the street. And two, to demap unbuilt streets located over mapped wetland areas to preserve the wetlands. The proposed development has not been constructed in part due to litigation related to necessary Department of Environmental Conservation or DEC freshwater wetland permits, which I will discuss shortly. The special permit would have lapsed without the applicant having filed a renewal application prior to October 31st, 2021. The applicant seeks the renewal of the original special permit in order to facilitate the development project as originally proposed. Next slide, please. So this drawing from the original approval delineates the freshwater wetland boundaries and shows proposed landscaping and stormwater management areas. There's a stormwater management area proposed in the wetland buffer to manage all stormwater generated by this development and moving through the site. And the red dashed line represents the northern boundary of the DEC regulated wetlands. As you can see, all of the proposed development is located outside of the wetland. Next slide, please. So while this is outside the scope of the decision before the commission, we do feel it is relevant to provide some context about ongoing litigation as it pertains to Community Board 1's recommendation. The ongoing litigation with DEC is regarding the previously approved freshwater wetland permit. An action was brought against DEC seeking to annul the permit. The motion to stop construction was denied, however, and the local community group is appealing that decision. However, the DEC permit remains valid during the appeal process. DEC is aware of the special permit renewal being sought, and uh, they have indicated to us in past conversations that they support that the special permit is valid. Next slide, please. Community Board 1's vote was in consideration of community members raising concerns about flood risk after the area was flooded during Hurricane Ida in 2021. The board voted four in favor and 29 in opposition to the renewal. Community board one voted with the recommendation, quote, that 
all permits for 534 South Avenue be put on hold until the flooding in the area is, is addressed and the appeal is heard and a verdict rendered. The board further explained their reasoning in a letter to city planning. The recommendation was categorized as conditional unfavorable. Next slide, please. So to summarize, the applicant is seeking a renewal of the original special permit to facilitate the project as originally proposed, a 219,000 square foot retail development and assess accessory parking for 838 cars. The commission may vote to renew the application provided that the facts upon which the special permit was granted in 2017 have not substantially changed. The zoning district and character in the surrounding area remain unchanged. The previously approved site plan has not been modified from the original application. And to close, I will reiterate one more time that the ongoing litigation is between DEC and the applicant and is not relevant to the renewal of the special permit. Thank you and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Ben, and great job. Uh, let's, let's just uh, make sure that we understand. So DEC granted a permit that the community uh, the, the, the litigants, the folks who sued here, uh, don't believe was strict enough in the interpretation of its own rules. Is that, is that the, the gist of it? That is correct. Yeah. Okay. And DEC um, uh, defended its own position and that lawsuit to enjoin the construction was denied. Uh, and the community group is appealing, but this permit from DEC is still valid, right? Okay. And yes. our analysis for the purpose of this special permit uh, renewal um, is that the proposed development is as originally designed and the conditions under the original proposal, they haven't substantially changed, correct? That's correct, yeah. And both continue to be true. The proposed development is the same, yes? Yes. And the conditions as they were when we approved them initially have not changed, is that right? Yes. Okay, and I'm sorry, what was the, the, the reason why this was not, uh, the, the reason it wasn't constructed was because of the litigation? Um, yes, it was in part due to the litigation and um, I believe that they were also seeking a, a city mapping action that, that delayed the project. They were just, um, they, they received the city map change as part of their original approvals. I think they were just going through the more technical steps that were a part of um, the post CPC approvals for it. So they were also tying off, tying out those, um, those ends too. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see if there are other questions here. All right, seeing none, thank you again, Ben. Uh, I am going to seek a sent by a voice vote here. So we're gonna take a vote on this one because it is a post referral review of a non ULERP. So you're gonna say that 10 fast, <laughs> 10 times fast, we're gonna see. Uh, but this is one where we take a voice vote here to send an approval uh, letter. So I'm going to do that now, unless there's any other questions. Uh, seeing none, I'd like a sent by a voice vote to send an approval letter here on, uh, that this is to the buildings department um, on this uh, application. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, All those opposed, nay. Okay. Thank you very much. We have assent. And with that, we're going to go to item eight. Thank you all. Ben. Thank you. So the eighth item on our agenda is a post referral review of our renewal of a previously approved special permit. Um, in this time in Manhattan, Community District 8. Uh, also presenting for this first time to the Planning Commission is Olivia Olmos. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon, Olivia. This is a private application by 19 East 72nd Street Corporation to renew a 74711 special permit for property located on the northwest corner of East 72nd Street and Madison Avenue in Manhattan, Community Board 8. Next slide. So the applicant requests a renewal of the special permit to allow for commercial use group six on the ground floor to extend into the R10 district and modify sign regulations to allow for accessory commercial signs 
in connection with the proposed commercial use. For further background, the original 74711 special permit was approved by the CPC on October 4th of 2017, and the resolution of approval became effective on October 26, 2017. The renewal application was filed at DCP on August 26, 2021. And DCP referred the renewal application out to the community board from project readiness on April 14th, 2022, and the conditions and details of the application on which the 2017 special permit was approved have not changed. Next slide. The project area at 19 East 72nd is on the corner of Madison Avenue and it's one block east of Central Park. The building is mapped within the R10 and C51 districts, partially within the special Madison Avenue Preservation District and the Special Park Improvement District within the Upper East Side Historic District. Next slide. So the project area is an existing 17-story residential building with 36 units. The ground floor area is a vacant doctor's office along the East 72nd Street frontage, but there's active ground floor retail use along Madison Avenue. The surrounding residential context contains several landmark residences, and the remaining surrounding area contains a similar mix of historic single family or multifamily townhouses with larger apartment buildings with non-residential use on the ground floor that's along the wide street frontages. Next slide. Here's a view of the site facing east from East 72nd Street. The ground floor facing East 72nd is the frontage of the requested use waiver for new commercial use and signage. And East 72nd is a busy, wide crosstown street with four moving lanes and two parking lanes. Next slide. Here's a view of the project area facing north from the intersection of Madison and East 72nd. The area is really well served by public transit. The six train can be found at Lexington and East 68th. That's the Hunter College Station. That's approximately a third of a mile, a six or a seven minute walk southeast from the project area. And the M1, the M2, the M3, and the M4 buses run uptown along Madison, and that's directly in front of the project area towards neighborhoods in Upper Manhattan. And they run downtown along Fifth Ave towards Madison, um, towards, sorry, towards Midtown Manhattan CBD uh, and other neighborhoods further south. Next slide. Here's a view of the project area facing northwest from Madison Ave showing the existing commercial uses on the building facade along Madison where those red awnings are. That's the current site of a high-end perfume retailer. Uh, many of these residential buildings contain ground floor retail or office uses, particularly on Madison, which is mapped as C51 district. And like I said, high-end fashion stores and boutiques are prominent. Uh, those are located on the lower floors of apartment buildings. Um, and a few stores are located in repurposed historic mansions, including the Gertrude Rhinelander Waldo House. Next slide. This elevation shows the ground floor site plan with com subject commercial ground floor use at the southwest corner of the building facing East 72nd. So the area highlighted in blue is 478 square feet. That's located in the C51 district and that currently permits retail use. And the area highlighted in orange is the portion of the ground floor located in the R10 district that was approved for retail use through the 2017 special permit. And the area highlighted in orange is currently occupied by a vacant doctor's office as well as the superintendent's dwelling unit. And the area in the C51 district has no door access to the adjacent space that's in the R10 district. So the only access to the space in which commercial use is permitted as of right is the existing door that's located in the R10 zoning district. And deliveries to the proposed retail space would occur through this existing door during non-peak uh, shopping hours. And since 2017, the space has remained vacant as the building's been unable to find a tenant to take advantage of that special permit. But the proposal states that the super's dwelling unit will be moved away from the street frontage to the back of the building on the ground floor uh, next to an interior courtyard. And that space would be quiet and a bit more private. Next slide. This elevation of the 72nd street frontage shows the presence of the newly proposed signs including two decal window signs in yellow, 
uh, one decal door sign and one freestanding post sign in orange um, at the retail entry in the R10 portion with an additional two decal window signs in the C51 portion. The signs would be non-illuminated and consistent with signage associated with pre-existing retail use in the building. And the Landmarks Preservation Committee has approved these accessory signs in the R10 district portion and determined they'd be discreet and suitable for the location. Next slide. The conditions state that the 74711 special permit requires the applicant to demonstrate commitment to continued maintenance and preservation of the building. And in 2017, the CPC found that the modifications have minimal adverse effects on the scale or bulk of the structure and the application and facts upon which the 2017 special permit were approved have not changed. Next slide. So at the May 11th, 2022 Community Board 8 Land Use Committee meeting, the board approved the resolution for 19 East 72nd Street for 74711 special permit renewal via ZR 1143. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much. And nice job, Olivia. Well, thank you. Um, so just uh, just for clarity, I think I understand it completely. Um, so the R. So within this building, you have a C51 and an R10. Correct. C51 allows use group six, R10 does not. The C51 Correct. has the door, the R10 portion does not. Correct. So whatever you're going to do there needs to be able to work in that entire space. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Um, okay. I think I got it. Thank you. Uh, let me see. If her, uh, oh, do you want to just say uh, just for a, a little bit more about what Use Group 6 uh, allows for? Yeah, sure. So Use Group 6 allows for retail and personal service establishments that serve local shopping needs. So things like food stores, bakeries, small clothing stores, beauty parlors, um, dry cleaners, et cetera, but also restaurants, small restaurants. Got it. Thanks. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, Chair. Uh, was it their inability to find a tenant? Is that why they didn't proceed after the uh, uh, 2017 approval when this came before? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the building's been able to find a tenant to take advantage of that retail space, um, really unable to take advantage of the special permit. They're looking for an appropriate and suitable tenant, uh, but they have high standards for who they want as the tenant. And they've noted that specifically they're looking for something that's consistent with the surrounding high-end Madison Avenue boutiques. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Marie. Sorry about that. Okay, on, try, yes, turn on mute. I apologize. Um, so, oops, we lost you. We lost you. Did you mute yourself again? I did not. Yep. Are we, we on go. now? Okay. Back. So, so thank you, sir. Thank you. So, the question that um, Commissioner Knuckles poses brings me to a question: If they weren't able to secure their high-end Madison tenant in five years, what's going to convince them that they're going to find one now in this day and age in the market that we're in where retail is really shrinking? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we can follow up with them about, you know, what may advance uh, the idea that they are able to secure a high-end tenant that fits their standards. Um, we didn't talk to the applicant about that, but we can go ahead and confirm that answer. That'd be important to know. And then my, my last question would be is, have they constructed the super's unit and moved the super to make the, the, the unit more, more um, tantalizing to a retail tenant? Yeah, I believe it would enhance the appeal of uh, attracting the correct tenant, a desirable and, tenant. And so they have, not, they have not moved it yet, right? They've not moved it oh, yet. That's the, that's the proposal. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems to me that <clears throat> that's part of the proposal. Moving the superintendent would be wise to try and get someone who can visualize a space because a lot of times tenants don't have the ability to visualize a space. And I think that moving the tenant, moving that the super now is critical. I mean, if they're going to do it eventually. They should have done this five years ago when the application went in is my own opinion, but thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions, comments? Okay. Seeing none, much like the last one, um, uh, I'm gonna seek out a, a assent here by voice vote to send a letter to the uh, Department of Buildings. So we're gonna do that now. I would like to seek assent by voice vote to send an approval letter to the Buildings Department on this item, 19 East 72nd Street. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Okay, we have assent. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Congratulations. Uh, and let's move on to item nine. All right. So the ninth item on our agenda is a post referral review of a non ULERP modification to a previously approved a large scale residential development. Um, definitely not presenting uh, for the first time is Matthew Pietris. Matthew. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this is a public-private application by NYCHA and Madison Realty Capital for a non euler modification to an existing large-scale residential development. Next slide, please. To reorient the commission, the project is located in the East Village neighborhood on the southwest corner of East 14th Street and Avenue C. The proposed development is a 24-story mixed-use, primarily residential um, development with up to, just a slight correction here, 166 residential units, uh, and up to 50 of which would be affordable. The building uh, would also have 2.2 thousand square, square feet of community facility space and just over a thousand square feet of retail space. Next slide, please. Uh, this image is showing the surrounding context. Right now we're facing uh, southwest towards downtown. In the center of the screen, we can see the proposed development at 644 East 14th Street. Just north of the development is Campo, or, uh, sorry, the Stytown Developments. Uh, and Haven Plaza, which is to the left of the screen here, is going to be about the same size as the proposed development. Next slide, please. So here, the requested action uh, is a non ulip modification to reflect several changes to the large scale. Um, the first two are related to the boundaries of the large scale. So the first would be the exclusion of a conveyed sliver of land on the northwestern boundary of the large scale. It's a very small portion of land that was conveyed in the 80s that is to be excluded from the large scale. The second would be to include the development site, which is shown in the upper right-hand corner of this image within the LSRD. And that would allow uh, the development site to merge with the NYCHA zoning lot and the development site. And then that would also allow for the transfer of about 108,000 square feet of floor area from the NYCHA campus to the development site. Uh, finally, the last modification would be to show the construction of the new building on the development site within the LSRD, and that is shown here in yellow. I want to note here that the department asks itself two major questions when considering whether a modification to a large scale constitutes a non ULERP modification. The first is, do the proposed changes require any special permits or other ULERP actions? Uh, the, the department believes that the answer to that question is no. This building would otherwise be as of right if not for the existence of the large scale. The second question uh, and the one before the commission is with the addition of the proposed development, do the findings of the previously granted waivers continue to be met? And the department believes that the proposed changes do continue to meet those findings. Next slide, please. Um, for recommendations, while this is a non ULERP item, during referral, both Community Board 3 and the Borough President submitted recommendations to approve the project. Both of those can be found in your briefing package. Uh, this approval was based in part on the approval given by the Campos Plaza 2 Tenants Association, which voiced its support for the sale of development rights to fund nearly $20 million in capital repairs at their building. I also want to express the department's support for this project. First, the proposed development will provide much needed housing during a housing crisis on one of the few empty lots in Lower Manhattan. Second, the project will also provide millions of desperately needed dollars for NYCHA to perform capital improvements for the hundreds of New Yorkers living in Campos Plaza 2. There are virtually no other sites that could receive the development rights that are generating these funds, which makes it particularly difficult for NYCHA to generate revenue to help bring Campos Plaza 2 to a state of good repair. 
Approval of this project, however, would allow for that sale and the capital improvements it will fund to occur. Uh, that's all, all I have for today. I'm here to answer any questions along with representatives from NYCHA. Great, uh, thank you very much. Let, let me just go back to that, the, the one question that you said is the one that we should be focusing on today, which is um, with this addition to the findings continue to be met here. Can you just say a little bit more about what those what those are or were and how we come to that conclusion? Sure. Um, so that, this is the second question that I brought up. Uh, so there were previously granted waivers on the site related to the development of the existing buildings. So that's Compost 1 and Compost 2. Um, when those were constructed in the early 80s, uh, they requested special permits to modify rear yard requirements, to modify distance between buildings. Um, and so in modifying the large scale to include this new development, uh, the question is, does, do these modifications continue to meet the findings of the old waivers? Um, there is a slide, uh, if we can pull back up the presentation, um, that shows where the existing waivers were being sought and where the new building is. Uh, and because of that, that's really why the department believes that the findings are continuing to be met. Yeah, so if right. we go down to the appendix, Jeff. A couple more. I think it's two, oh, and one more, oh, two more. Here we go. Uh, yes, so here we can see in red, those are the old waivers that were granted. Um, and so these are nowhere near the proposed development. Um, and so the findings uh, that were related to those waivers, we believe do continue to be met because the, the new development does not affect those and does not um, further them in any way, further the way it's being sought in any way. I see, I see. So it relates to the previously granted waivers, which aren't actually anywhere near this building. Correct. I see, yes, okay, got it. Um, and no special permits are needed for this new building because it otherwise could be built as of right, separate and apart from the existence of this um, plan, this large scale plan. Correct, so, so um, but it does need to be included in the large scale so that the transfer of floor area can occur. And so without the inclusion of the development site within the large scale, um, the $20 million that's gonna be generated for the improvements to um, the Compost Plaza two buildings could not take place. Got it. Uh, let's see if there are other questions. Okay, uh, I don't. I don't see other questions. So this is another situation where we're going to uh, seek uh, assent by a voice vote here uh, to send approval to DOB. So with that in mind, I am now going to seek assent by a voice vote to send an approval letter to the Department of Buildings. Um, on this item. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Okay, we have a sense. Aye, Leah. Okay, one, one, no. Thank you. We'll move on to number 10. Okay, so the 10th item on our uh, agenda is a city council modification scope determined to uh, 4541 Furman Avenue rezoning in the Bronx Community District 12. Um, and the city council has proposed to modify the text amendment that's associated with this, this project to remove the uh, transit zone designation from the area proposed for rezoning. Um, staff believe that this modification is within scope, and I believe Sean and, and I are both here to answer any questions about this. Okay, let's see if there are questions about this one. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, what would that mean? Would that impact the parking issue? Yeah, so the, uh, the transit, uh, the transit zone designation lowers or, or eliminates the parking requirements. Um, and so my understanding is that this, that the applicant had already increased the parking on 
proposed for their project on site and that it so that that would not change from what the was discussed with the commission um, but there are uh, non applicant controlled sites that are um, that are in the rezoning area that would also uh, be required to provide parking at at the sort of standard R7A uh, rate uh, of parking. That's right. It would not affect the development as proposed, and they've actually already increased uh, their parking for the for this development at the request of the community board. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, this is a scope determination. Um, so, uh, and it is uh, your, <clears throat> the department's view that this is in fact yes. a modification that it's is within scope, scope whether, yeah. whether it's something that the department would have proposed or agreed with is a different yeah, story yeah. altogether. That's yeah. right. Okay, <laughs> I got it. Okay, um, all right, let's, uh, let's do this. I would like a sense by a voice vote to send a letter to the council saying that these proposed modifications are within scope. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 I say, I say aye, but I request that we again add our dissent uh, on the substance of it, even though it's within scope. Opposed nay. I'm just abstaining. I wasn't here for the, I was absent for the actual vote. Um, and I'm abstaining on this one. Okay. Um, okay. So we have one abstention. And um, Commissioner Bernie, your your point is also noted. We are uh, we are working with our colleagues in the council uh, and the council land use division uh, to do our best here to try to um, uh, work on these uh, these applications productively and try not to uh, see the same sorts of amendments uh, down the line. Whether it's shrinking sites of rezoning areas or certainly this may be just a philosophical determination on size or scale of transit zone, but uh, we certainly take that point. Um, okay, uh, let's go to future votes, Ryan, item 11 on our list. Sure, so for future votes uh, for Wednesday, uh, June 29th, we have for consideration by the City Planning Commission, uh, 258 Flag Place, 859 Lamont Avenue, and 54 Ridgecrest Avenue which are all actions uh, pursuant to the special districts on Staten Island. Uh, staff believe that the findings have been met for uh, these actions and are recommending approval. Is there any questions? Any questions on these? Three Staten Island items, special districts. Okay, let's go to 12. All right. Uh, for post hearing follow up, we have 1810 Randall Avenue, and I believe uh, Manny Lagaris wanted to speak to us about this, right? Okay, Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, Jeff, can you move to the last slide, please? Okay, at the uh, public hearing, the commission had a question regarding if there were any resiliency requirements for the proposed building. This is the 1810 Randall Avenue rezoning, <laughs> uh, an eight-story building, mixed-use building. And the answer is no. As you can see here by looking at the flood zone, the uh, project area that's uh, circled here in blue, uh, is not within the flood zone. Therefore, there are no resiliency requirements. Okay. Manny, anything else? Uh, no, that's all. That was the only question that came up uh, that needed to be followed up. Okay. Any questions for Manny on 1810 Randall? Okay. Thank you, Manny. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, and we have 1959 Strang Avenue. Uh, if there are any further questions regarding this proposal. Okay. And 3106 Northern Boulevard, this is a commercial overlay for the restaurant. 
Uh, if there are any further questions after the hearing on that. Okay, not seeing anything. And then on Hallett's North, uh, we have Teal Daly is here to discuss. Teal? Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this presentation is a postering follow-up for the Hallett's North rezoning and special permit. Next slide. In previous presentations, commissioners shared concerns around several features of the proposed development. And these concerns included a need for clarity around the number of proposed dwelling units, especially given the other large projects that have been approved on the peninsula. Um, also the desire to examine appropriate affordability for the proposal and some concerns around open space that include the scale of the open space in comparison to the overall development as well as the quality of the open space, um, especially in regards to the motor court and vehicular versus pedestrian experiences on the site. Um, also, there's been concern for environmental impacts and encouragement for DCP to secure robust mitigation. And so in addition to speaking to uh, most of these concerns, I'll also be sharing modifications proposed by the applicant to the project. Next slide. So starting with a brief overview of the requested actions, this is a private application by Astoria Owners LLC for a series of land use actions to facilitate approximately 1 million square feet of development in Astoria Community Board 1, Queens. Um, requested land use actions include a zoning map amendment from M11 to an R73C24 zoning district, a zoning text amendment to map mandatory inclusionary housing area option one, a waterfront special permit to waive regulations on height, setback, tower size, and maximum width of walls facing the shoreline. Waterfront authorizations to modify requirements within the waterfront public access area, as well as a waterfront authorization for phased development of the waterfront access area. And finally, a city map amendment to demap the portion of Third Street between 26th Avenue and the East River. Next slide. The project area is located on the Hallett's Point Peninsula on the East River waterfront. The immediate area, immediate surrounding area is predominantly characterized by low rise warehouses, vacant industrial buildings and open storage yards with a handful of one and two family residential uses. The New York City Housing Authority Astoria Houses is located on the Southern portion of the peninsula. High density residential waterfront development in the area includes the existing 23 story shore towers condominium development which is located just to the northeast of the project area, as well as two major prior land use approvals on the peninsula that would cumulatively contain over 4,000 housing units when constructed. Um, of these two prior land use approvals, just one building at Hallett's Point has been constructed with 400 housing units. Open spaces in the area include Whitey Ford Field, Hallett's Cove Playground, Astoria Park, and also nine acres of open space is planned for the Howitz Point and Astoria Cove Esplanades. The surrounding area is served by several modes of public transit, including four bus lines, the n and trains via the Astoria Boulevard and the 30th Street subway stations, excuse me, um, the New York City Ferry, and the, the ferry has a stop approximately um, half a mile south of the project area. Next slide. The requested actions would facilitate uh, the development of a mixed use building with three building segments, which would contain approximately a million square feet of floor area or six FAR. And so the applicant had previously proposed 1,400 dwelling units, and they're now proposing 1,340 units to accommodate more family sized units. And this is specifically at the request of community board one. At the time of certification, the applicant had proposed to map both MIH options one and two, but they have since committed to MIH option one, and therefore 335 units would be permanently affordable um, based on the 25% of the total floor area required by MIH option one. The applicant has also agreed to um, engage local residents, including Astoria houses on the affordable housing opportunities this project would provide. I'll note there is no change in overall floor area, especially the residential um, of the project proposal. Next slide. 
and the proposed development would continue to include approximately 1,800 square feet of commercial floor area, approximately 22,000 square feet of community facility floor area, 525 accessory parking spaces, and the equivalent number of bicycle spaces, and approximately one acre of publicly accessible open space. And with North um, looking towards the right of this um, floor plan, diagrammatic floor plan, uh, the configuration and entrances to each of these spaces has not changed. Next slide. And so now the illustrative render to the left shows the maximum zoning envelope and the render to the right shows the applicant's proposed um, modified building envelope. A modified building envelope concept was shared at the public hearing and the Queen's office and the applicants um, have since been working to further develop the envelope as shown to the right on this slide. In the modified proposal, the floor area would remain the same as well as the overall heights of each tower, but the applicant has worked to modify the building envelope to improve the pedestrian experience. And so what would change as shown to the right is the amount of space between the buildings, which would increase, and the size and shape of the base of the building. The base heights would be lowered with deeper setbacks that so would allow some of the waivers to be reduced or eliminated. Next slide. And so expanding on the previous slide, the render to the left shows the proposed envelope from the perspective of the East River from an aerial view. And the render to the right shows the back of the building from an aerial view from 26th Avenue. The base heights would be lowered to the, the standard maximum R73 height of 65 feet. Problems. Oh, can you hear me now? We can hear you just fine. Keep, keep going. Okay. Um, and so the, the base heights would be lowered to 65 feet. And then the middle building segment would be set back from the upland connection 16 feet in 10 inches, which is an increase from the previous proposed 10 foot setback. The distance between the towers would also increase. This would be from 38 and a half feet between towers one and two, and also uh, 65 feet to 78 feet between towers two and three. These design modifications are intended to break up the tall sheer faces of the towers with an articulated building base, which would um, improve the experience of the pedestrian as they walk down Third Street. The towers would retain their height, as I mentioned before, and this would continue to provide a substantial amount of floor area for housing, including the proposed permanently affordable housing. Um, but more space between the towers would also allow for more light and air to reach the street level. Next slide. This render shows the retail corner looking from the intersection of 26th Avenue and 3rd Street. And this would be a triangular carve out of the corner of building segment one, um, including movable seatings and planting. The applicant did provide this render, but they've also explained that the design from the street level would not change from what was proposed at certification. Next slide. And this render shows Third Street with the proposed vehicle and pedestrian upland connection looking from 26th Avenue towards the East River. The applicant provided this updated render as well, but no changes are proposed um, from the street level. And so this portion of the proposed development would continue to have a type two upland connection with both the vehicular and pedestrian access, as well as the masonette residential units that also help break up the long facade along Third Street. Next slide. So this slide um, in the render on the top, this shows the certified design proposal for the motor court. And then on the bottom, this shows the newly proposed components of the motor court. In the certified proposal, the applicant included boulders around the edges of the, the wide circular turnaround to provide delineation between pedestrian and vehicular spaces, but also allowing the sufficient space for the required FDNY access to the site. But to increase the emphasis on the pedestrian experience in this area, the applicant added a few more design moves that would provide more space and amenities to the visitors of the waterfront. The applicant proposes to add movable seating and planting within the turnaround, and these could be removed or pushed aside by an FDNY truck accessing the site in a worst case emergency. 
but on a daily basis, the vehicles would pass through the area using a lane delineated by a mountable curb that leads in and out of the parking garage. So this area would just allow like a couple of cars to pass each other as they just pull in and out of that garage. Um, but the large surface of the motor cart would be broken up and would be more, more usable by pedestrians with the movable seating. Um, and ultimately the safety would still be maintained since there is separation between vehicle, the portion of the site that the vehicles access and the portion that the pedestrians use. Next slide. Several components make up the WP, the waterfront public access area as shown in the diagram on the screen. So starting from the left of the diagram, the type two upland connection, which is shown in blue, would add the vehicular and pedestrian access with a driveway through the middle and two sidewalks flanking either side. This connection ends in the motor court I shared on the previous slide. The upland connection contains 13,800 square feet, which is equivalent to 32% of the waterfront public access area space and 8% of the entire lot. And now jumping to the right side of the diagram, a short public walkway is shown in orange, and this meets the required 40 foot width, which is required by zoning regulations across the entire shoreline of the site. So in total, the short public walkway would contain 15,600 square feet, which constitutes 36% of the waterfront public access area and 9% of the lot. Finally, the supplemental public access area is shown in pink on the diagram and would contain 13,600 square feet of area or 32% of the waterfront public access area and 8% of the lot. This component of waterfront regulations tends to be located uh, between and around the upland connection and the shore public walkway but in, in total, all of these elements together need to add up to 20% of the total lot area. And so this applicant would create a publicly accessible open space that constitutes 26% of the total lot area, while also delivering the necessary square footage for each of these components. And I'll talk more about waivers later, and these waivers will impact the design of the waterfront open space, but they do not reduce the area of the open space. Next slide. Another component that's been added since certification is the waterfront overlook, which was shared at the public hearing. The applicant proposes 1,400 square feet of space in this overlook furnished with seating and tables that can be moved for different types of use, um, such as seating for daily visitors or a different kind of arrangement for hosting events. The overlook would be ADA accessible and does so cover some of the planting proposed in the riprap. Next slide. So now I'll step into the authorizations in the waterfront public access area. The applicant is requesting a series of authorizations to facilitate a superior site plan and overcome site planning constraints. Most of the authorizations facilitate the unique oyster inspired design motif, as well as the proposed upland connection uh, with both vehicle and pedestrian access and um, planting all along its length. Other authorizations facilitate flood resilient construction and proactive strategies for stormwater management. Next slide. So this chart shows all of the authorizations requested in relation to the zoning regulation or zoning resolution requirements, um, but I'll walk through the authorizations in the following slides. Next slide. Pursuant to zoning regulation um, 62822A, the applicant proposes to modify the waterfront public access area regulations by raising the visual corridor base plane to permit resilient construction, as well as modifying the widths of the upland connection walkway, transition area, and supplemental public access area. Next slide. And pursuant to zoning resolution section 62822B, um, the applicant seeks a series of modifications to the waterfront up public access area to allow vehicular access on the planted upland connection. These modifications um, include permitting the vehicle access, delineating the vehicle area by bouldered, boulders, boulders instead of bollards, modifying the tree pit width, and reducing the pedestrian clear path. I'll note though that reducing the pedestrian clear path only is only at like one touch point. It's not 
all along the upland connection. It's just one small area in the motor court. And next slide. Other modifications include um, reducing the lawn requirement, and this would allow the oyster motif and the view terrace, um, but also shifting the bike rack location and modifying some lighting requirements. And finally, the applicant seeking an authorization to construct the proposal in phases. Next slide. In summary, the applicant has proposed changes to the proposed development that include the waterfront overlook within the WPAA space, um, which is a response to a CB Community Board 1 request, as well as modifying the building envelope. The Queen's Office has been and will continue to work with the applicant on shaping the building massing with those goals of breaking up sheer tower faces and increasing access to light and air to generally reduce the bulk, uh, the feel of bulk in the buildings. And then this project is also in the process of finalizing the EIS. And so uh, we'll continue to work with city agencies as well as the applicant team to confirm mitigation. And this is something we can share in another follow-up. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Teal. And uh, I um, certainly want to encourage you to continue to work with the applicant on the, the shaping of the massing and breaking up those uh, sheer tower faces and adding light and air. Uh, to this development, it seems like there, there's progress here, which is uh, encouraging. Um, so we, uh, I certainly want to encourage, encourage um, you to continue to have that conversation. It's important. Um, okay, let's see if there are other questions and comments. Okay. All right, I think uh, I think uh, we're clear on this one, Teal. Thank you very much. I don't see other questions or comments, so we'll we'll leave it there. And I'm going to go to Ryan to see if we have anything else on our agenda for today. Oh, that that's the end of our agenda today. Fantastic. So let me just uh, uh, do a um, just a quick uh, thank you here to uh, the commissioners for your time, and certainly to the staff of uh, the Department of City Planning, in particular the the three or four newbies who came for the first presentation today, they all did great. Uh, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you all uh, on Wednesday at 10 o'clock for our public hearing uh, on a, a number of the matters uh, that we uh, talked about today. And with that, um, we will part, we can adjourn. Thank you all, see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Take care. Take care.